Yo Atlas speaking and welcome to part 6 of what if I was reincarnated in the One Piece world as a sky peon. Let the tale begin. Chapter 131 Kaido The morning sun was radiant to the skin and dazzling on the seawater. The whole place was brightened up by the reflection of the glowing and dancing sea waves. Under the light, the small crowd of people outside the pirate ship were whispering to each other. Their target of whisper was the man in front of them, clad in black, wearing a silver steel mask. It is kind of disgusting seeing you eat the food all raw. The man, Amon, who changed his previous anonymous mask, said as the people looked at him confused. Obviously, as a pirate, he must be lying, right? After a few seconds of battling through the people's gaze, Hitetsa removed his sword from Amon's neck. Amon grinned under his mask. His eyes created crescent moons. It is indeed disgusting and a little unhealthy too. Perhaps you can make them delicious, traveler. Hitetsa said, his voice still as stern as steel. Hitetsu was quite strong, and with his high insight, he couldn't sense any type of malice from Amon. Though in truth, it was another form of hiding presence from Amon's side, similar to Yona. Thank you, Amon smiled. I had the plan to do so, to begin with. Amon planned to get closer to them using one of the easiest ways, food. The cooking fire was dancing. Zzz ch ch ch. F fascinating. Hitetsu exclaimed in shock and surprise. He was intrigued by Amon's cooking that his shining eyes were looking at. That's a fascinating scent. It's be been a long time I smelled something like this. Amon chuckled and continued to shake the spoon inside the pot. Hitetsa gulped his saliva. To think I will witness such quality Odin made by someone other than Odin-sama. Ha ha. You are praising me too much. I can't even cook it properly. That's right. Amon was cooking Odin. In the pot. There was an assortment of vegetables and proteins such as processed fish cakes, machi rice cakes, boiled eggs, daikon radish, konjac yam, and tofu. And stewing them in a light broth seasoned with soy sauce and a special soup named dashi in a large hot pot at the center of a table. As a cook, Amon wasn't at the level of Sanji or some other famous cooks, but he was at least confident enough in his abilities to outmatch the cooking of a swordsman like Odin. Haha, do you like the scent that much? Amon quickly picked up a bowl from the other table beside him and filled it with Odin. Then how much will you like the feeling in your mouth? Amon raised the bowl towards his face. Oh. With slightly shaking hands, Hitetsu accepted the bowl. He loosened his mask a little only to show his large swollen lips and took a sip. His eyes instantly grew up as he jumped from excitement. Oh. This is great. After a few seconds, Hitetsu's cheeks were covered in tears. Tea this is magnificent. Ha ha. The Odin was good, but not at the level of making him this emotional. Amon basically made the specific soup of Odin to control him emotionally, to form a connection between the dead Odin and himself. Young man, thank you. And it worked. Then, thank you so much. He was simply too happy tasting something like this. The food he last tasted when Odin gave him a bowl 23 years ago. You don't know how happy I am. Hitetsu was born in Wano. He had wings just like his father, and it seemed his ancestor came here from another country where people had wings, Burka. Unfortunately, being so far from the family tree, he didn't know much about the Burkan god, so Amon couldn't exploit his position here, sadly. It's fine. I am happy to make you so pleased, Amon said and handed Otama a bowl too, who was hiding behind Hitetsu's massive figure. By now, Amon had already found out where Nidai Katetsu was. Truthfully, he would have just taken the sword by force but there was a better way by acting nice. If he steals it, he can't stay here anymore. Thus, Ace's crew can't stay here anymore and they have to flee inside Wano. In that scenario, Kaido, who hadn't left yet, would come and kill Ace, thus destroying his biggest plan of all time in this world. It would be meaningless to mess everything else just for that sword. To begin with, the sword was just a side quest. Amon doesn't only want to take the sword, he also wants to take Odin and Toki's daughter. Hayori's blood sample along with the diary of Odin from Yamato. Not only that, he needs to lay low to make it seem like he was a person from Ace's crew and everything he did was because of him. That meant after Ace would join Whitebeard, Amon would pull strings if Cannon doesn't go the same. Then Kaido would not go after Ace since he won't try to pick a fight with Whitebeard. Even if he does, it's not like he would be able to defeat them. The only time he would go after Ace would be in the War of the Best. Why am I so sure he will go? It's because he already tried to participate in the war in canon, just that Shanks had stopped him. In the war of the best, against two emperors and their army, the marines will definitely lose. Thus, benefiting Amon and his plans, 
and with his interference, he might succeed at killing off Kaido as well. Who knows? All in all, it was a win-win situation, as long as Amon acted like a decent human being for a while. Soon after, Hitetsa walked towards the tied-up spade pirates and bowed lightly. I, as a samurai, am ashamed to have captured you, benefactors. He stayed in that position for a minute before raising his head. Please, allow me to free you. He took out his sword and before Ace could even feel any danger, slashed forward. In the next seconds, the rope binding fell on the ground like old leaves. Woohoo! The crew cheered as they stretched their limbs. Meanwhile, Amon was busy giving people bowls full of Odin. They were excitedly eating after accepting it. Among them, the girl named Otama was also eating, swiftly pouring everything in her mouth. Nom! So tasty! She quickly finished her bowl as she noticed people asking for seconds and getting them. Fearfully, she walked towards Amon. Big brother, see can I have some more? Seeing Otama raising her bowl like that, Amon laughed and poured more Odin in the bowl. She showed a bright smile and again started to eat the food. Hitetsu was very touched seeing this. Otama was like a granddaughter to him. She rarely has a full belly. This made him emotional and grateful towards Amon. Odin is certainly better than eating raw. Signed to himself, he grabbed a bowl from beside him and walked towards Amon to get a second. Yo, you are pretty good with children, mister. The brown-haired pretty woman named Perry went to Amon and stroked his shoulder with hers. I wonder how you will behave with your own children, hmm? Amon lightly shoved her away and concentrated on cooking. Don't disturb me. Ah, why are you like this? Can't you spare some time and talk to a pretty lady such as myself? For a second, Amon stopped cooking and looked at her face. While she flinched, Amon observed her from head to toe and turned back with a chuckle. I have fucked prettier once. What? Nothing. Amon shoved her away and prepared to cook some more Odin. Amon concentrated on cooking while the woman kept disturbing him. The crew also ate food while laughing. A side Amon and Perry every now and then. He was just happy that she was interested in another person outside the crew. Only he knew how fortunate this was. Still, it felt unpleasant seeing someone who was interested in you acting like that with another man. Chapter 132 Amon's Intro It was early morning. In the sky above 10,000 meters, the sunlight was brilliantly shining over the busy Shandora. By looking closer, one could see the winged people training wholeheartedly, as this was their only job right now, training until they collapse. Around the island of Shandora, another island was floating on the sea not too far from it. It looked like a theme park from far, but from up close, one would notice it was fully empty, void of any life. This was the newly reconstructed Thriller Bark. The reconstruction was based on Walt Disney World's Magic Kingdom and Wonder Mountain, two famous theme parks from Amon's previous world. In truth, zombies were hiding in every nook and cranny of this land. This was literally a dead park. The moment certain conditions are met, this whole place will change in its looks. Zombies will spurt out from everywhere, the shadows will come out as Yona would command, while the newly made constructions will turn old and creepy, the thing only possible because of the high-tech space technologies. This would be enough to scare people, most people. However, the construction of a new place would start again. A new, mobile island would be made. There, it would be Eternal Night, the true domain of Yona. Currently, inside the spooky mansion of Gecko Moria, hidden behind many uninhabited buildings, two people were present with a dead body standing still in front of them, being experimented on by the power of Shadow Shadow Fruit. Rogue. Grok. The zombie was groaning every now, and then while the other two people in the room were out of breath. Oh, this is so hard. The person who was controlling the zombie, Yona, sighed. She scratched her head while sitting on the luxurious mattress that could easily room an entire family of four. Beside her, Sumi was sitting as well. One might as well notice, Sumi didn't have a shadow even though there was a light bulb shining in the room. For that reason, to keep her safe, the windows of the mansion were closed. After all, if the sunlight touched her, she would be burned alive. Sumi scratched her hand nervously. It definitely is a strange feeling having no shadow. Although she was nervous and disgusted by the zombie, she didn't want to disobey Amon. Amon came here a few days ago and handed them a body, ordering Yona to force the dead body of Deuce to use his devil fruit. Sumi was appointed to help her, so she was helping her by giving her shadow temporarily. For that reason, to keep her safe, the windows of the mansion were closed. After all, if any natural light like sunlight touched her, she would be burned alive. With such a restriction, people without shadows couldn't exist here freely. To begin with, 
Amon decided to reconstruct this place so that shadowless people couldn't hide so easily. In the previous thriller bark, it was a flaw where shadowless people could hide and later on plan their way out. However, Amon didn't want that so he fixed the loophole. Now, if someone really wanted shelter from the sun, they needed to fall back to the demo buildings or this mansion. When they do so, they would be found and experimented on. While the dead person's cold and white body was moving under Yona's commands, some shadowless people in the other room beside it were trying to eavesdrop. They were captured and waiting to be experimented on, so they were doing their best to look for a way to escape. Among them, Big Mom's 23rd daughter, Lola, was also present. Amon had quite some plans for her. Again, Sumi opened her mouth. Archpriestess, so is it a failure? Can I have my shadow back? She then started eyeing the human in front of her. This was the body Amon delivered here. One could tell it was a dead body since it was releasing a disgusting scent. Yet, it was standing as if it was alive. The body was only able to stand because of Tsumi's shadow. This was the body of Masked Deuce. Yona looked at Sumi. I think. You can. She sighed. I can't force him to activate his devil fruit. I don't think he even has any of his powers anymore. The main reason why Amon wanted Yona to learn and control people's devil fruits was this. To control the possible remaining power of a dead man. Imagine how powerful a zombie Whitebeard would be who can still use his powers. Ha, huh, Sumi sighed. So is it as Kami-sama said? His powers really left his body after he died? Just thinking about it gives me chills. Yona just shook her head and went to fetch Sumi's shadow. However, wait, Sumi suddenly grabbed Yona's hand. Her face was strangely excited. Is it not possible to make this guy eat another devil fruit? Won't that give him powers? Think about it. She was excited. If this worked, then Amon will definitely praise her for this idea. Alas, Amon already had this thought. It was an interesting question. The answer was also pretty interesting, yet simple. Amon POV. By now, Yona must have succeeded or failed. Personally, I think it would succeed. After all, even though genes can change 0 to 100, they can't go back to 0 again. Well, I am being biased as I do want the experiment to succeed. My knowledge of genes is not the best, like sometimes I might be fully wrong or partially wrong, but never fully correct. Visiting Germa is absolutely needed. I decided to ignore the thoughts, they were meaningless. Rather, I paid attention to the little girl sitting beside me. We were not in the seashore anymore. Currently, I was inside Hitetsu's house, sitting on the floor. The room was traditional Japanese and I quite liked it. The girl nudged my black jacket. Mr. Brother, why do you call yourself fool? It was a little girl named Otama, the bearer of a very useful fruit. She contained any animal and even the gifters. To be honest, I would have killed her and taken her fruit. Brainwashing her won't be a good idea since she is physically too weak to be that useful. I am not killing her only because I don't need a fruit that can subdue animals, at least not yet. My conqueror's hockey is enough, for now, her fruit's use to me is close to zero. Let's not think too much of it. At least let's act like a decent guy until this job is done. Sighing, I answered her question. Because humans are foolish, just that my foolishness stands out more than normal. She seemed confused at my answer. Huh? You aren't a fool though. She replied. But I didn't lie. I was a fool. Without even thinking twice, I did many morally wrong things. But did I? Or do I care even now? No, I don't. I wasn't sure why I was being philosophical today, but it didn't feel bad. However, there was no time to waste. Kaido should be preparing to leave now. I just stroked Odama's head. Anyway, call your grandpa. Tell him I've been waiting for a long time. Un. She nodded and ran off. Looking at her back, I again had the thought, should I kill her? Anyway, I should talk with Haitetsu for a while. I am quite interested in how a Birkin came here. Maybe I can find some interesting clues? Soon after, Haitetsu entered the room while I was sipping a cup of tea. General POV. While Amon was busy in Onigashima, Kaido was preparing to leave. Beside him, King was standing with his hand resting on his sword. Kaido-sama, it's a small matter. You don't need to intervene. I can take care of it. King continued. A mere bounty hunter has the audacity to disobey Beast Pirate. I will make sure to kill him. King was talking about the bounty hunter, Cider. He was the bounty hunter from a filler episode and movie, Stampede. When Amon was a bounty hunter, he absorbed Cider's guild and made it a part of Valkyrie. Now after he is an emperor, Cider is under him, but in secret. To the world, Cider left the guild after Amon became an emperor, 
but only Cider knows that he is nothing in front of that monster and is still working under him in fear. Kaido laughed, Wurro 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 Wurro. King, don't you think I should stretch my limbs now and then? Kaido continued. Besides, since I have a meeting with Daffy, then why not visit him myself rather than inviting him here? Amon knew about this. That's why he planned it knowing Kaido's personality. First, Kaido will go to dress Rosa and when his meeting is done, he will go hunting Cider. King muttered. That? King. Kaido glared at him. That's it. Let's go now. Turning his head the other way while King stayed silent, Kaido then transformed into his dragon form and started to fly in a single direction. After staying silent for a few minutes then glancing at Jack and Ryo behind him, King also took off. Jack was also supposed to come with them, but to make the newbie familiar with this place, he was ordered to stay behind. Fwa. In Hitetsu's house, Amon was sitting while sipping tea while Hitetsu, the man wearing a red mask, was sitting in front of him. Amon put the cup down and asked the question he had in mind. Mr. Hitetsu, do you recognize this? Amon took out the sword from his waist, there was a scabbard that was covered by a white piece of cloth, halting the curious gaze of people. Hitetsu's eyes instantly arched up as the blade entered his vision. He didn't notice because it was under a covered scabbard, but how could he not recognize this masterpiece that his ancestor made? Is that... Kitetsu I, Shoai Kitetsu? Amon nodded with a strange chuckle. Yes, this is the sword that your ancestor made, right? A slash in. All the Kitetsu blades aren't made by Hitetsu himself. He only made the Kitetsu 3. The Kitetsu 2 was made by his ancestor Kotetsu, and in this fanfic, the Kotetsu I is made by Kotetsu's ancestor. H. How? No, why do you have that? Hitetsu was suddenly alarmed. Could it be a sword thief? Again, Amon chuckled lightly and dropped the sword on the floor beside him. Yes, I will answer that. But first you need to understand who you are. Who? I am. Amon nodded. He opened his mouth and explained what a Burkan, Scipion, Shondorian is. Where they originated from, and who he is. All in all, it was a summary of Hitetsu's origin race. Hitetsu was shocked yet again. So you mean to say, I am a Burkan? Yes. He made a thinking pose as he scratched his nose. It's not impossible. I do look different from Wano inhabitants. But I have known for years that my ancestors also had wings like me. There was. Even a tale about me being from a place far from here. But I have grown simply too old to care about it. Now, Wano is my home. After experiencing hardships along with the people here, I can't think of any other place as my home. Now can I? Amon just side nodded. Yes, I get it. I didn't mean to ask you to return, I was simply curious if you knew why your ancestors came here. Amon had a hunch, the hunch most likely was true. I am, not sure. The old man said. I am already very old and was not interested in this when I was a kid. I already forgot even if my father or grandfather ever said something about this to me. Amon just sighed and sipped tea again. I guess it can't be helped then. Suddenly Amon blinked as he had an idea. Hey, old man, can I ask you something? Hitetsu looked confused, but he nodded. Amon offered, want me to take Otama to the sky. She won't starve there. She can have Karna as a playmate. He can slowly corrupt her. It would be perfect. It was a tempting offer. Along with Amon's good image, there was a high chance of acceptance. But the answer was simple. I can't do that. Otama is only four years old. She can't live without me, her guardian. But Otama, who was hiding behind the door, had a different opinion. She quickly ran towards Amon and hugged him tightly. Mister, will you go adventuring in the sea? If so, then I will follow you. It wasn't hard to make the little girl accept this appetizing offer. Still, Hitetsu tried to refute, B, but Otama. It's too dangerous. She was like his granddaughter, letting her go with a pirate, even if it is Amon, just seemed weird. Otama showed her tongue to Hitetsu. Boo, Grandpa, I want to go. Finally, between their shenanigans, Amon passed two hours while Hitetsu finally accepted the offer. Though it is mostly because Amon revealed his wings, making Hitetsu feel a strange sense of familiarity from him. This is actually a better option than killing her. Chapter 133 The Plan Amon POV The first thing I need to do is get the blood sample of Hayori. This should be enough to prove Toki's arrival here. I gotta say, the AI played me good. Laughing to myself, Thinking how it might have been better to just have destroyed her, I sipped coffee from the cup in my hands. Currently, I was standing by the seashore of Curry, enjoying the sunrise. Ueno was based on Japan, so the sun rising is a delightful spectacle here. I noticed some coconut trees around the place, 
they made me a little thirsty for coconut milk. Fwa. While feeling the wet sand on my bare foot, I enjoyed the light breeze caressing my hair. It's already been two weeks since I've been here. Just like in Canon where A supposedly spent a few weeks with people in Curry, this time around, we have already spent two weeks. From what I learned, it seems Kaido's meeting with Daffy hasn't ended yet. I got the news from Viola. I do hope Daffy remains smart and doesn't reveal my visit to Dress Rosa. Anyway, I can't waste more time than this. I waited because Ace waited, but now I need to move and force him to move as well. I am not scared of clashing with Kaido. I will survive even if I can't defeat him, but Ace will surely die. Losing a golden egg laying goose such as him would be a shitty ending. Fa. I released a hot breath causing fog to come out of my mouth. I am going to take the biggest gamble on war of the best two years from now on. It would be my proper advancement to an emperor. Currently, I am just all bark no bite. Releasing another sigh while reminiscing over my past life without any particular reason, I spent my time in the seashore until the sun was above my head. General POV Ace, I will search for the whereabouts of Jack. Saying this, Amon had left an hour ago at night. Since he already knew about Jack's whereabouts, he just needed an excuse to use when asked meaningless questions. They would easily believe sense to them. Amon's power is to teleport as that's the only power he showed up until now. But this was not a complete excuse either. Because as planned, Amon targeted Hyori now. It was a little hard to find her in this country filled with millions, but since he's been looking for her since day one, Amon easily found her. Unlike Hitetsu, Amon didn't have anything to chat with her about so the best course of action would be to enter her room at night, get her blood, and exit the room. So here was Amon now. In the red light district of Flower Capital, he entered the biggest brothel of Wano at night when everyone else was asleep. Z z z z. Amon teleported inside Hayori's room as he spotted something. Interesting. The first thing he noticed after entering the room was a person hiding above the ceiling of the room. He wasn't a thief. He was Hayori's personal guard who didn't sleep at night for the sole reason of protecting her. It was Denjiro, one of the nine scabbards of Odin who currently under the alias, Kayashiro. He was awake, sitting above the ceiling, his owl-like gaze was on the room, looking for any intruder. The moment he spots someone other than Kamurasaki, Hayori, he will jump and cut them down. Luckily, being prepared for this already, Amon was wearing an invisible coat. He has got quite a few of them made before. From the single copy he had when he first went to Burka to fetch the Garo Garo Nomi, he made many more copies after using it as a base with space technology. It is many times better than Sanji's Germa suit's cloak. Amon, to not make any sound, started to float a few inches above the floor. He flew towards the sleeping Hayori, who was covering her body with a futon and took out a syringe. Silently sending electrical signals in her brain to control her sleeping body, Amon made Hayori slowly pull her futon down and pointed the syringe on her forearm's blood vessel. C-H-H-H-D. M-H. As the needle pierced her skin, Hayori groaned, making Amon frown. He stopped and waited for her to get used to the needle, then seeing her eyes still closed he started to pull her blood on the syringe. N-N-G-H-H. Amon blinked hearing her clear moan. It was weird why she was reacting this way. Amon was a little flustered, but he continued to slowly pull the syringe. However, this small sound had alerted Denjiro. Who is there? Suddenly, a sound came from above the ceiling. Thud. Denjiro, the owner of the voice, jumped down. He was loud enough to wake up normal people, but for someone who's been looking after Hayori for more than ten years, he knew she was a sound sleeper and didn't hold back his throat. He looked at the heavily breathing Hayori with narrowed eyes. The room was dark, but as a samurai, he was used to it. He couldn't find anyone around Hayori, then what was her cause of groans? He blinked. A dream. A wet dream, maybe. The thought instantly vanished the moment it crossed his mind. His lady was already 22 years old, after all. Although this might be considered a funny situation, it was not for Amon. He frowned and prepared to knock him out, however. ZZZTT. A mosquito arrived at the perfect time as Denjiro's frown deepened. Hearing the annoying sound the mosquito was making, he clenched his katana's hilt. A mere mosquito dares to hurt Lady Hayori. He took out his sword and slashed the mosquito once, cutting it into seven pieces. Damn, WTF. Amon chuckled internally seeing this. As Denjiro turned around and jumped on the ceiling again, Amon quickly pulled Hayori's blood while making sure she didn't moan. After completing the job, Amon instantly flew thousands of kilometers and went to the Skypea. 
He put the blood sample in a concealed test tube and put it in a refrigerator to keep the blood fresh. After completing the job, Amon's duty was to make Aish trigger using Jack's noose. Sitting on the seashore of Curry, under the night sky filled with stars, the crew was enjoying a barbecue cooked by Amon. Zchhh. The crispy scent of burned meat made everyone hungry, especially Ace who was drooling. Your cooking never gets old, haha. In this timeline, the crew didn't have an official cook. So, normally Perry used to cook most of the time, but her cooking was severely outmatched by Amon's. She was quite jealous of it, and it was the first reason why she got interested in Amon. Her jealousy quickly vanished as she traveled together with him, and she rather started to bear a liking towards him. This time around, though, she didn't want to let Amon enjoy all the praise and made the hot sauce. Foo foo. You like it? Wayno spices are top notch, the best I tasted. Just put some in your mouth, will you? Perry laughed and declared. Amon's metallic mask was versatile and can be removed part by part. Like he can open the mouth part while still wearing the mask. He did so, opening the mouth part of his mask and put the piece of meat dripping in the yellow sauce. MMM, it's good. Amon chewed on the meat. I guess it does make the meat taste better. Good job. Seeing Amon approve of her, Perry felt her heart flutter. Amon's characteristics weren't the type to make people fall in love with him even if he was quite handsome. Generally, people would be interested in a one-night stand, but since this time Amon was manipulating a woman willingly, there was no way Perry wouldn't have fallen for him. Ha <laughs> ha. Right. She avoided eye contact and ate her food, almost choking in nervousness. Around an hour passed by as everyone enjoyed the food. Otama had joined the party midway she was also eating her food while sitting on Amon's lap. Suddenly, while stroking Odama's hair, Amon asked Ace, Ace, I found out that Jack is on the island beside Wano, Onigashima. Ace stopped chatting with the crew and looked at Amon seriously. Amon continued, Kaido and his right hand, King, is out of here for a while. If we want revenge, this is the perfect time for that. Ace frowned. Why? I want to defeat Kaido too. I don't want the people here to suffer. Amon scoffed at him internally. This is why he didn't like people with hero syndrome. Ace. Amon yelled loudly, making Ace flinch. Tell me who is stronger, you or me? Huh. Ace was surprised as he blinked. He was surprised why he suddenly yelled, but he decided to pay attention to the question for now. If this was the past him, he would have instantly said he is stronger, but he has seen Amon hunt down dozens of sea kings easily, which he couldn't do. You are stronger. Ace said with a sigh. Amon nodded. He made his eyes sharp like a person giving a motivational speech. Yes, I am stronger, and that me is saying I can't beat Kaido. Actually, Amon might successfully beat Kaido, but Ace doesn't need to know that. Mr. Port asked D. Ace, are you perhaps assuming your hero complex will help you another time? Amon continued in a harsh tone. Wake up, Ace. You already lost one of your companions, you were lucky to even survive. Don't risk your companions' lives anymore. Think about it. You said you have a brother, right? Imagine what he will do if Kaido kills you. Ace sighed as he recalled Luffy's smiling face. He will come to take revenge. Amon nodded, his eyes grim. Yes, he will. You see where I am pointing at? Kaido won't spare the kid. Luffy is nameless. Finally, dejected, Ace nodded. I understand. It was quite interesting how someone like Ace accepted the suggestion of someone else. Ace bit his lips. I get it. The crew was shocked as they looked at Amon with admiration. In truth, they didn't want to fight Kaido either. But they knew their captain was stubborn, so they were mentally preparing themselves for a death battle. Ace ignored their gaze and said, Then what should we do, mister? After a brief silence, Amon's eyes went back to the amicable look as he laughed. It's good to see you understand, Ace. Don't worry much. If you want to save these people, just get stronger. He said, Remember, strength is everything. Kaido is able to trample this country because he has the power to do so. Anyway, Amon created pressure around him as he grinned. Now, what we need to do is to invade Onigashima, the place where Jack the Drought is. It was time. Time to see what the Diary of Odin had. Chapter 134, Jack the Drought. Onigashima. It is the HQ of Beast Pirates. Most of the members of the crew stay here, so even other emperors would think twice before attacking this place. However, Ace was different. He had one goal to kill Jack, and he would take any risk to accomplish that. As a pirate, he has done many bad deeds, but he never killed a person before. However, losing a companion changed him. Still, he only wanted to kill Jack, not pick a fight with all of Beast Pirates. For that reason, 
Currently, he and the crew were under disguise. Hence, Amon and Ace's crew were now heading toward Onigashima in a small boat. Meanwhile, according to what Amon knew, Jack was still in Onigashima, and Ryo was sent to Udon's prisoner mine. Certainly, for a person like Ryo who couldn't stand seeing the weak suffer, it angered him to the loftiest extent. However, he wasn't brave enough to do something against Amon's plan. Amon didn't care and rather put more attention on the raid tonight. Ja. The sea waves were rough, leaping high in the sky, colliding with each other. Giant fish and sea kings were jumping out of the water with their mouths wide open. They were fighting among themselves, biting one another. It was a tumultuous scene. However, surprisingly, among this rough climate, a small boat was moving through the sea. In the boat, a person who was wearing a black jacket, as if magic, controlled water and slashed a blade made of it towards the sea kings. Fishman Karate, Water Slash, PSSD. The water blade cut the head of the fishes in a matter of seconds, splashing a large chunk of water on the small boat. Ah, the boat shook from the impact of the water. The riders screamed but ultimately managed to hold off. They took a while to regain their composure as they looked at the waterbender. Woohoo! That was awesome, just like Jimbe. The people riding the boat cheered towards the person who controlled water, Amon. All of them were wearing a black jacket and black pants, while a pair of red horns were on their head. People would assume they were members of the Beast Pirates, but in truth, they were the Spade Pirates. According to Amon's plans, along with Amon himself, the crew disguised themselves and were heading towards Onigashima. Man, you are good, Ace said while standing up from his lying position. He fell when the water hit the boat. Just how many abilities do you have? He asked while patting his wet chest. Amon laughed in response. Many. They didn't question much and just chatted while killing some sea kings and holding off the boat. They left a while ago from Curry. Amon promised Otama to return and pick her up later on. Soon after, they reached the outskirts of Onigashima. So, where do we go now? Ace asked while crouching behind a box. The crew was crouching just like him, hiding behind boxes and pillars of the cargo ships docked in the shipyard. In Onigashima, Kaida receives smiles from Daffy by these ships. Amon and the crew were hiding inside one of them. Onigashima, although not as big as Wano, was still pretty big. That was the reason why Ace, in the cannon, was able to destroy things yet nobody of the Flying Six attacked him, nor did the others, only because he was away from the big shots. He was just happily chatting with Yamado and eating food with her. Currently, they were on the part of the island where Jack was on the watch, away from the Flying Three. As Amon had planned, there were no other big faces to stop them other than Jack now. Amon's plan goes like this. 1. Make Ace fight Jack. Certainly, he will lose. Two. Then intervene and kill Jack. But making sure the news gets out that Ace killed Jack. 3. Watch out for variables, such as Yamato who will most likely intervene. And that's when Amon will move and steal the diary, giving Ace all the credit. It was a well thought out plan, and no problem shall occur as long as Amon, an emperor, helps. Amon was absorbed in looking for Jack with his observation and didn't hear Ace's question. So, Ace asked again. Um, where do we go now? Oh. Amon, who was surprised, blinked. Give me a minute, I am looking for him. As he said this, Ace nodded and Amon closed his eyes. Even with a range of 300 kilometers, it was hard to look for a specific person in the middle of thousands. After a few minutes, Amon opened his eyes again and looked at the faces of the crew. Guys, I found him. He is alone and drinking wine. Ace grinned shortly after. Then what are we waiting for? Let's go. Above the roof of Jack's personal mansion, he was sitting in a chair with a barrel filled with wine in his hand. He was depressed since his inferior complex hit him hard and was spending time drinking. It was then, bam, Jack heard a loud sound coming from not so far. He instantly got up from the chair and widened his observation hockey. Intruders Jack looked far and jumped from the roof, leaping far in the air. No, he can't use Jeppo. He was just that confident in his defense. Thud. Jack fell in between some soldiers, making a crater in the ground. J. Jack-sama. There are intruders. Jack walked in heavy steps. I know. Prepare for battle. He walked as he slowly started to transform. He was in a bad mood, so he would use his hybrid form, which although weakens his defense, is fast and strong enough. Slowly, Jack's body changed as he transformed into a furry half-elephant, half-human. The crew wanted to hideously reach Jack. But from a mistake made by one of the crew members, they attracted the attention of the other small fries after entering Jack's residence's quarters. The crew easily took them out, 
but one of the enemies used a bomb to create a small explosion, thus alerting Jack. While the crew finally finished the small batch of enemies inside Jack's mansion's borders, they discovered the man with an elephant-like trunk, horns, and fur walking towards them. Behind him, other mobs were following, but strangely, they slowly fell on their face without any sound. It was almost as if someone moved very fast and knocked them out. Jack didn't notice this action at all. He just looked angry. He opened his jaws. Oh, it did you guys. So you followed me all the way here. The crew noticed him. Ace's furrows knitted. Meanwhile, Jack's aura seemed to ease up a little seeing these weak bastards. Initially, he assumed, to dare infiltrate Beast Pirate's HQ, the other party must be strong, but to think it was these weaklings. However, soon after, his veins popped up. He was already angry from before, but now this angered him more. Hiki, you fools. Jack didn't care anymore. He didn't kill them last time because of Ryo, but he has snapped now. He will only rest after killing Ace. Fwo. Jack kicked the ground and dashed forward at an astonishing speed. This hybrid form allowed him to act swiftly while still bringing about great strength. However, Ace didn't plan to fall back now. He couldn't remember what he did last time, that special technique he used. Yet, he didn't fall back. His anger didn't let him. Ace started to heat the steam around his fist. Soon after, it started to glow brightly. Fire. Ace punched at Jack who was only 10 meters away from him. Fist. He has perfected this technique on his way here. Now he can produce heat equivalent to an actual flame. Ja, boom. Ace's fist glowed blue and gushed towards Jack 10 meters away. Immediately, it caught on his fur as he got lit up in a fire. W-O-W, -wow, he is burning. Ace won. The crew cheered, but it didn't even last two seconds as they realized Jack didn't stop on his track and was about to hit Ace in the face with his trunk. For a moment, they got Deuce's flashback. They recalled how he was killed. No, Ace. Perry's voice rang the loudest among the crew members shouting. Jack obviously didn't care and swung his trunk. Ace clenched his teeth to receive the blow while someone moved. Bam. Jack hit Ace, but the hit didn't touch him. Because a man has walked between them. Well, isn't this interesting? You were burning, but you were fine. It was the soothing voice of the man in the mask. Ha, huh, the defense of ancient zones is terrifying. Jack didn't answer. He was just a little shocked at where and how this man suddenly came here. He didn't even see him move. Still, Jack just took a step back and breathed a large chunk of air with his trunk. Phew. Then with a single gust of wind on his body, he turned off the fire. It was interesting how he was able to do so since normally, his fur would burn hotter because of the oxygen. As if guessing the question, Jack answered. Logic doesn't work when you surpass a certain threshold of power. He was right. Logic didn't work for some people, however. Jack wasn't the only one. Amon was also one of them. Amon laughed suddenly. Ha ha. Ain't that true? But, you are weak. Jack the drought, let me show you. The limit of logic less power. While Jack was shocked and angry, Amon raised his hand towards Jack's head. This is true power. It defies logic. His hand suddenly glowed. Plasma, Elthor. A yellow-reddish beam of compressed lighting came out of Amon's palm and went towards Jack, who had wide eyes. It was plasma, the pure heat extracted from lightning. Jack had wide eyes in the slowed-down world. As he observed the beam come to him slowly, he got lost in thought. This is like Kaido-sama's heat breath. Jack thought. He couldn't think anymore as he was hit by the beam in his face, soon getting completely engulfed in the beam as it increased in size. z -ch 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 -ch. The air was soon filled up with the smell of crispy mammoth meat. Chapter 135 A One-Sided Battle z -ch 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 -ch. Jack, badly wounded and fried, fell on his back making a thud sound. At some places of his body, like elbows, knees, and neck, the flesh under his skin was visible as his thick skin was already burned. After all, plasma is hot. As hot as Kaido's heat breath which can literally destroy mountains. But how can Amon who has lightning logia, control plasma. It is simple. It's because lightning in itself is plasma, it is basic science. Can and Enel and Amon could always use plasma, like how Enel's Elther managed to create massive craters in the ground due to the heat. However, that was not what one would call pure plasma. To use the pure plasma, Amon had to surpass a certain voltage output and achieve a certain level of control over his devil fruit. Currently, the reason he's able to manipulate plasma is that Plasma is just superheated gas made up of charged ions, and Amon controls those ions using his ability to manipulate electric fields. It was hard to achieve, but after four years of nerve-wracking training, 
Amon finally obtained it. Ah. The crew, along with Ace, just gasped. Their lips bobbled. That's all. It was an incredible achievement. One shotting a Yonko commander was an unachievable feat. However, before they could get anywhere more with this, Jack's body shook. A loud grumble sounded out. Ark. Jack, surprising everyone, stood up slowly. That was quite powerful. Who are you? Of course, Amon didn't care enough to answer. Unfortunately for Jack, with Amon's terribly big reserve, he can spam this attack another thousand times. Ark. While Jack was enduring the pain and finally managed to fully stand up, Amon raised his palm in the air facing his chest again. Good grief, just die already. Wum. Amon's palm glowed, blinding the place in dazzling light as another beam came out of his palm. Ja, boom. Explosion. The beam came out of his hand and headed towards the surprised Jack, exploding the moment it touched his body. A again. Something at that level. Is a repeatable attack? The crew shouted in shock and surprise. It truly was a surprise, after all, Jack was the person who almost killed all of them. Ace regained his composure a little as he looked at Amon's back. He never thought of this before, but if this man can do something like this, he must be at emperor level himself. Teleportation. Water manipulation. Now fire powers. How many more abilities does he have? Ace thought with his fist clenched and sweat falling down his back. Amon and Ace. They both agreed before that they would both try to kill him since they both held a grudge against Jack. It would be a first come first serve. So, at this rate, it was certain that Amon would be the one to kill. After holding his fist tight for a while, his grip loosened as he sighed. I am thinking too much. It's fine as long as Jack's death is witnessed by my eyes. Ace lowered his head and stared at Jack with burning eyes. Zichh. As Amon stopped his attack, Jack fell on his back again, more wounded than before. However, not so long after, he got up yet again. Huff. You bastard. Huffing, he yelled and rushed towards Amon with his trunk raised. I will kill you. Jack's hybrid form had less defensive powers than his mammoth form, so it was natural that he would transform right now. And he was doing just that. Ruhr. Jack's trunk started to spin in the air like a helicopter as he thrashed it downwards. Bam. Surprising him, Amon blocked it with his left hand and grabbed his trunk with his right hand, trying to slam him to the ground by it. However, that was all. He tried, but he failed. Jack's mammoth body was too big. So even if Amon had enough strength, he didn't have enough size to back it up. Jack laughed seeing this. Haha, do you think you can throw me like this with our puny bod? Z, 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 z. Before Jack could finish his words, Amon's body suddenly grew along with his clothes. Thunder Giant. Hybrid form, Amon used a better version of his previous, legendary Super Scion transformation. His body grew and grew until it became 60 inch 7 feet tall, slightly bigger than Jack's mammoth form. Jack's eyes grew as he felt his body slowly rising in the air. What? Before Jack could say anything more, Amon picked him up by his trunk and slammed him to the ground. Bam. That wasn't enough though, as soon after, Amon made a sphere of lighting on his palm similar to Whitebeard's when he uses his quake powers. This is an advanced version of shockwave creation that comes with Rumble Rumble Fruits Rumble powers, which he once used in Alabasta's palace to break all the windows. With his palm like that, Amon grabbed Jack's head like how WB did to some vice admirals in Marineford. Tremor. Rumble. Crack. Lighting danced inside the sphere damaging Jack's brain aggressively as his eyes soon slowly turned white. He mumbled his last words, impossible. Jack's eyes turned white, his consciousness faded, he was forced to turn into his human form. Amon didn't waste any time, he grabbed Jack's neck and shocked his brain into consciousness again. Jack didn't get the chance to understand why and how this was happening because using his giant arms, Amon had lightly tossed Jack into the air and punched him in the stomach, sending him meters away, landing on the mansion. Bam. While the mansion crumbled down and the spade pirates looked at the one-sided match with wide mouths. Amon ignored them and teleported a hundred meters away in front of Jack, proceeding to grab him by his neck again. This time around, Jack couldn't exert any strength or hockey and was on the verge of losing consciousness, so this was the perfect moment to use hypnosis on him and ask what his fruit was. Yes, even on such strong people, hypnosis would work as long as they are beaten like this and are on the verge of losing consciousness. Jack, Amon said, his voice was vibrating. This was also a more efficient way to hypnotize someone than using a pocket watch. Tell me what your fruit's appearance was. Meanwhile, outside the broken mansion. Hey, should we go in there? 
It's already been around five minutes, Perry said looking at Ace. Ace couldn't say anything. He just clenched his fist right. How weak he was. He understood. If Amon was an enemy, he could have one-shot him. And I was thinking of challenging Kaido, the strongest creature. Blood dripped from Ace's fist because he was clenching it too hard. Not so long after, Amon, who was back to his normal size, walked out of the debris of the building while pulling an unconscious Jack by his long blonde hair. Ace, Amon shouted and threw Jack in front of Ace. Finish him. What is this? Ace questioned himself. Why was Amon allowing him to kill this bastard? Didn't he want to kill him as well? As if knowing his question, Amon opened his mouth while looking at him. I have already granted him the pain I wanted to deliver. Although the fire of revenge hasn't subsided within me, I assume you also want to take revenge for Deuce. Ace was shocked to hear this, but Amon just grinned under his mask. So do it, kill him. A few seconds passed under silence. Ace opened his mouth but closed it in the end. It doesn't matter. I understand. He muttered. He will take the chance and kill him, obviously. In truth, there was a reason why Amon was asking Ace to kill Jack now. It was because. Forty minutes ago. On the northeast side, the crew left the ship to search for Jack. In the middle of Onigashima in Kaido's mansion, a young female was sneaking around with a club similar to Kaido's in her hand. Hiding behind a box inside a room, the girl tried her best to avoid the incoming patrollers. A few minutes passed as the patrollers left the room. Releasing a large sigh, she then mumbled, Father is out. It's the best time to escape. The girl was Yamado, Kaido's delusional son. She wants to become like Odin and save Wano, so with no other way left, Kaido has put a collar on her neck which will explode if she tries to leave Onigashima. Yamato looked at the collar in her neck. He was obviously bluffing when he said it would explode. Or so she believed. Anyway, she didn't care. What she now needs to do is escape Onigashima using a ship on the northeast side. Yamato prayed. This is a flawless plan. I will succeed. She clenched the diary in her hand. This diary was very precious to her, so she would take this with her. I will escape. Although she did think initially, all the sound of explosions near Jack's mansion attracted her while she was running towards a ship. She sneaked in there, hoping she will get to witness something interesting. But what was this? Fire fist. Who would have thought that she would witness the death of Jack's in the hand of a chest-naked man wearing an orange hat with a tattoo of ASC on his hand? Chapter 136 Flag Ace POV. Jack was in front of me, lying unconscious. I felt my blood boil. Now Ace, go for the head. Hearing Mr. Fool's statement, I clenched my fist. Jack's defense in his mammoth form was high, but in his human form, it's nothing extraordinary since he can't even use hockey. He is unconscious, so this is the best time to kill him. Still, I can't believe it. Am I going to kill a human? The thought made me hesitate a little. I hesitated for seven seconds before clenching my jaws. It didn't matter anymore. I don't care anymore. You killed Deuce so he has to die. I was grateful that Mr. Fool is giving me this chance. I am sure he also wants to kill him, yet he is being considerate of me. Ja. As if to cheer me up, my hands lit up. It was fire. A fist made of fire. I looked at Jack's head. His metallic jaw mask was still there. I decided to melt it. I raised my hand in the air and targeted Deuce's killer. Jack's head. Deuce. I yelled on top of my lungs while tears fell down my cheeks. Look at this. Fire fist. My fist went towards Jack's jaw mask as it caught fire, melting itself down, melting down his mouth in the process as well. This is the fire I obtained after your death. Look how it burns this bastard. Deuce. Melting his mouth wasn't enough though. Ja. The fire soon caught up to his hair and started to burn his whole body. I fell on my knees. I punched the ground. I felt my heart calm down by a lot. It's as if I lost a large weight from my shoulders. Kneeling on the ground, I yelled at the sky with a tear and snot-filled face. Deuce wherever you are, be happy. I have finally succeeded at taking revenge, but I wasn't really happy. The emotion I was suppressing up until now burst out as I started to cry. I was going to cry some more, but a voice brought me out of my dream world. Who are you guys? General POV. Who are you guys? Suddenly, a voice brought Ace out of his world as he looked around with blurry eyes. The figure of a young woman entered his eyes. She was wearing a kimono and a pair of horns on her head while wielding a spiky club. It was Yamato. From the side, Amon grinned ear to ear under his mask. Obviously, he knew that Yamato was nearby. That's why he asked Ace to kill Jack in the first place, 
rather than killing him by himself. Mission 1, completed. Now he just has to snatch her diary and escort Ace out of here. What can go wrong? I asked you a question. She shouted again, her eyes shaking the ashes left behind by Jack's body. Yamado hated her father, but seeing one of her father's precious people getting killed like this still hit her heart. She again prepared to shout, Hey, you guys, but Amon moved. He simply teleported behind her and chopped her in the neck at a high speed. Feeling the attack coming, Yamado tried to block the attack using her Thunder Bagura but failed miserably. A. H. She silently fell down, knocked unconscious. While nobody was looking, Amon grabbed the diary from her belt and put it in the bag beside him. It was filled with dials and two fruits. Surprisingly, one of the fruits was slowly changing, starting to possess encrypts. Mission 2, complete. Amon just put Yamado down on the ground. He would have brainwashed her, but unfortunately, she has advanced conqueror's hockey, so it would be impossible. Amon stood up as he put Yamado down. Ace, we shouldn't waste any more time, let's go back. Ace nodded shortly after. It was time for mission 3, safely getting out of Wano. Same time. Meanwhile, in Skypea, the new thriller bark was being modified once again. This time around, a secret city was being made under the island. Here, with the main island as a cover, the sun itself would be shunned and blighted. This would be a land where the red moon, light bulbs, never sets, where the solar eclipse never ends. A land forever lost in desolation, never to be grazed by caressing warmth. This is a prison. Yes, Amon needs a prison for the ones who disobey him, and Yona will be the warden of that prison. Currently, only a few very loyal Birkins were here, in the underground of Thriller Bark. They were constructing a jail, a prison that is planned to be more secure than Impel Down. They were giving their all to make it perfect, just as Amon wished. Both Robin and Riki were here to help Yona. They were also giving their all. At least Robin was. Currently, besides the Birkins, most of the workers were zombies made by shadows. Yona, who was standing between Robin and Riki, shouted, Hey, Yona, 4, go to the south area, help Yona, 11. She was shouting towards Yonas. Currently, there also were more than 10 Yonas working while the main Yona was managing them. This was the multi-shadow clone technique. Moria could use it as well, but he could only make one clone. But by mixing her own shadow particles with other people's shadows, she can make multiple shadow clones. Obviously, the idea wasn't hers, it belonged to Amon. Beside Yona, Riki and Robin were standing. While Robin was helping the construction by materializing extra hands from here and there, Riki looked at Yona with a bright smile. Hey, Yona, wanna go out? I will take you to the best restaurant in Gran Tizaro. With giving her a glance, Yona just shook her head. No, and stop it, or I will tell Kamisama. Fuck. Riki gritted her teeth but didn't give up. Then what about your clone? At least give me one of them. Hearing this, Yona frowned and turned around to face her. Her eyes were glowing. The atmosphere suddenly turned wild. Suddenly, Riki gulped and took steps back. Um. Yona, calm down, triple A. Before Riki could finish her words, Yona kicked her shadow, making Riki fly a dozen meters away. Boom. Riki crashed into a crumbling building. I told you to stop. Meanwhile, Robin just sighed from the sidelines. She stroked Yona's hair. Yona, don't hit her every time. She is just desperate. Okay. Yona nodded and enjoyed Robin's hand. Robin giggled lightly and opened her mouth looking around the prison. Anyway, let's hurry up. Let's make this place perfect, according to the blueprint. Same time. In Curry, Otama was patiently waiting for Amon to return. It's been a few hours since they left. She assumed it would take a few days for them to return, yet, she couldn't wait. She was scared. What if they leave her like this? Otama really wanted to travel the sea with Amon and see how the outside world is. She would be greatly disappointed if Amon leaves her here after giving her false hope. She looked down, there was a bowl full of food in her hand. But she didn't have the appetite. Beside her, Hitetsa sighed. Otama, eat your food, or you will lose weight. How are you going to become a Kunoichi then? Otama shook her head. Grandpa, I won't just be any Kunoichi, I'm going to be the best and travel with Mr. Brother. A laugh soon entered the room from outside. Ha ha, Otama, that's why you need to eat your food. It was Amon's voice. Mr. Brother, you are back. Anyway, we need to leave quickly. Or a ferocious dragon might come, you see. While Otama made an O oh face, Hitetsa released a long breath and stood up. This meant they succeeded in killing Jack. 
This proved Amon had enough strength to protect Odama. Haitetsu opened his mouth after hearing Amon. You are going to leave so soon? Amon showed his seriousness by his visible eyes. Yes, or things might go haywire. I see. He bowed suddenly. Then I would ask you for the last time. Please take care of Otama. Make sure she gets a good childhood. Amon nodded with a light laugh. He didn't know how much good of a childhood she will get to experience with the creepy Karna as her playmate. He can already imagine him saying, Did you bring this girl for me? Can I dissect her? Otama ran and hugged his legs tightly. Meanwhile, the spade pirates were standing behind him, all of their heads down. Knowing their thoughts, Amon stroked Otama's hair and looked at Ace. Ace, do you want to stay here for a while? Or leave right now? Ace barely formed a smile, but it looked bitter. Do what is better. I trust you. Amon just nodded and opened his mouth. Then I suggest, let's leave. Soon, they prepared the spade pirate ship. Amon is supposed to escort them back to Risky Red Island. Finally, Otama broke down crying. She hugged Hitetsu tightly for half an hour while Hitetsu asked Amon to knock her unconscious. It was better for her to leave with Amon. She will get good enough to grow up fast. Surprising the curry inhabitants, Hitetsu went to Amon with a sword in his hand, holding respectfully. He bowed towards him deeply. For someone like you, who has the Kitetsu I and also the Kitetsu III, it would only be natural for you to have the Kitetsu II as well. He raised his head and looked at the surprised eyes of Amon. Truthfully, I am giving this as a token of gratitude for taking Otama with you, as this is the only treasure I have. I thank you very much. Please accept it. Amon sighed as to show some decency, but accepted in the end. With this, his decent guy period also ended. Nine hours later on Agashima. On the other hand, the beast pirates had arrived at where Jack's mansion was and found the ashes of Jack's body. However, since Amon had hidden Yamato's unconscious body within the ruined mansion, they couldn't find her. Around nine hours later, Yamato barely opened her eyes. The first thing she saw was the silhouette of a giant man falling over her body. Yamato, what happened here? Chapter 137 King of the Beasts, Kaido Hours ago, in Dress Rosa, Da Flamingo was escorting two people out of the royal palace. The sound of three people's footsteps were overlapping each other as they finally reached the rooftop of the palace. The two guests walked in front while Daffy stopped a few steps behind them, waiting for them to turn around. As Daffy thought, they both turned around and looked at him. The large and buff man with a tattoo and scar on his torso laughed. Wararo, Doflamingo, you don't have to escort us any further. This is enough. Hearing him, Daffy snickered. Kukuku, as you wish, Kaido. Though I don't mind escorting you to Wano if you want. H.M. Besides the other man, another tall figure wearing a black suit covering him head to toe nodded. No need. Kaido-sama and I have work to do. Indeed, they were Kaido and King. They exchanged some more words before King opened his mouth again. All right, then we will be off then. Keep up the good work, warlord. Daffy nodded as Kaido ignored them and transformed into his dragon form, leaping into the air. King followed suit. As their figures vanished, Daffy could only sigh in relief. Sigh. He then gulped his saliva. This past week, Da Flamingo was thoroughly considering if he should tell Kaido about Amon's small trip here or not. Instantly, he shook his head. No, no. T that bastard will definitely kill me. Even if Kaido does kill him later on, I am sure before dying, I would be executed by him along with my family. Clenching his fist hard, Daffy chuckled. He couldn't believe he'd be cornered like this one day. Anyways, it's better to keep Kaido in the dark or else both of these crazy emperor bastards will be after me. Kukuku. Daffy chuckled nervously while from afar, Viola was observing everything with her devil fruit ability. Fwa. King flapped his wings as he passed by some birds in the sky. He was somewhat faster than Kaido, but he was still following behind him. After a while, his earbuds rung, he slowed down to receive the call. Not long after, King went towards Kaido's massive face. While the wind was blowing fast and rough, the two started to chat. Kaido-sama. What is it, king? Kaido replied to him in his usual tone. Kaido-sama, the guy we are after, bounty hunter cider. He started a fight with the beast pirates already. Since there are only the gifts against them, it seems we are losing. Kaido's veins started emerging upon hearing that. Huh? Then speed up, king. Wurararo. Kaido's speed drastically increased as he used more yellow clouds to help his flight. King also increased his speed. Cider is a bounty hunter one of the few bounty hunters working in the New World. For a while, he was called the best at his field before Amon came to be. 
Cider has a deep hatred for pirates, especially devil fruit using ones, and possesses a serious desire to kill them all. This desire is not out of any sort of altruism, but rather stems entirely from a love of money and the desire to gain revenge after being attacked by Douglas Bullet many years ago. In canon, he was pretty weak and was prone to boasting about his purely weapon-based abilities and was confident that he could take down any pirate, even monstrous ones like Bullet, Boa Hancock, and Monkey D. Luffy even though he lacked any forms of special abilities like Devil Fruits or Hockey. However, all those were boasts as he was always defeated like any typical villain. Nonetheless, working under Amon, he was forced to learn Hockey and was much more powerful than his canon counterpart. Being a part of Amon's hidden battalion, Cider was forced to do as Amon asked him, so he was now distracting the beast pirates according to his boss orders. However, he wasn't scared, rather he was excited. Being arrogant, he heavily underestimated all the emperors other than Amon. He even assumed when Kaido would come, he might kill him. Obviously, today, only death waited for him. When Kaido's troops arrived to fight off Cider's guild a while ago, the battle was one-sided and the bounty hunters were on the winning side. The guild and the pirates were fighting because of one rumor. The guild supposedly holds an ancient zoan, and Kaido wants the fruit. He wanted to simply buy it from the guild, but Cider refused. In truth, this was a ploy and such a fruit never existed. Amon planned to use Cider as a decoy to keep Kaido busy for a while, even if it's an hour. He knew Cider would die, but his value to him was too little to even care. Bam. Cider and his guild were fighting the beast pirates' gifters. They were easily handled with Cider Guild's water weapons. The guild possesses surprisingly good and high-tech weapons. This was shown in the movie and anime too. The fight was taking place in the middle of the sea. There were no islands around. Only the blue sea was in sight. In the sea, there were more than 40 ships surrounding another big ship. The ship of Cider's guild. DHU DHU DHU. From the big ship, Cider fired a water cannon towards one of the beast pirate ships which brought it down easily. Shuawala, Emperor of the Sea. This is easier than I thought. Cider laughed as he continued to shoot down the ships. There were many ships, but they were no match for Cider's water guns. After all, they were reinforced by space technology. Even though the beast pirates had the advantage in number, their 40 ships seemed to be on the losing end. They were being attacked with hydro cannons and rail guns fired from the big ship while they were just shooting measly cannonballs. Things were looking good for Cider. However, they were soon about to take a turn. Not long after the sky turned dark, it wasn't because of clouds rather because of a large entity. Roar. It was the king of the beasts, Kaido. Cider finally understood. He made a big mistake. He felt his blood freeze from the sight of a dragon. Minutes later, King stood beside Kaido who was standing on the deck of one of the 40 ships. Kaido-sama, since this job is already done, you should head back. I will take care of the small things here. Yeah, this wasn't fun at all. Kaido replied grumpily. While both of them were chattering, beside them in the sea, the leftovers of a wrecked ship were floating. They had burning marks, indicating the use of heat breath. Kaido lightly massaged his neck as he looked at King. King, it was a waste of time to come here. I will go now. Take care of the small fries that survived. You got that. King nodded. Yes, Kaido-sama. Kaido didn't spare any more time as he transformed into his dragon form and leaped in the sky, going towards Ueno using an eternal log pose. That's how we come here, in Onigashima, while Yamato gained her consciousness under the debris of Jack's broken mansion, Kaido's shadow fell upon her. Kaido, with his veins pronounced, asked her, Yamato, what happened here? Yamato gulped in intimidation. It was clear what the king of the beasts would do when his subordinate was killed, and most importantly when the diary of Odin was stolen. Meanwhile, in the sea far from Ueno, inside the ship of spade pirates, Amon was talking on a tone dial. From the other side, a sweet feminine voice sounded out. Yes, Kaido left Dressrosa hours ago. Without saying anything, Amon cut the line of the dial and looked in the sky. It was quite hard to notice his small smile under the mask. Rather than a disaster, this seemed like an opportunity. I wonder how it would be like to fight the king of the beasts. How far have I come? Amon was excited about the fight. He knew, now that Kaido was back, a fight between them was inevitable if he wanted Ace to get out of here safely and join the Whitebeard Pirates. He was confident enough to hold up against Kaido, at least for a few days. Meh, I might even successfully kill him. Chapter 138 I hate this. Ugh. Father. Get up. Tell me what happened, Yamato. Kaido ordered with an angered face. Grabbing her head, 
Yamato sat down and explained to Kaido what she saw. How the man wearing an orange had killed Jack ruthlessly. She didn't know his name, but Kaido knew it was Ace because of the report Jack made after returning from Risky Red Island. Suddenly, Yamato's face went dark as her eyes grew up while her mouth widened. She quickly touched her waist, the place where Odin's diary was kept. The place felt empty? No, no, it can't be. Feeling nothing, Yamato instantly jumped up and looked at Kaido, frustrated. F father, my diary is gone. Huh? What diary? Kaido answered with a confused yelp. Yamato told Kaido about Odin's diary, how she had it with her from the beginning. Hearing it, Kaido was more baffled than angry that she hid this truth. However, that didn't last long as stress soon took over him. It took a while for him to make 2 plus 2 equal 4, and soon it was clear who stole the diary, the one who killed Jack, Ace. According to Jack's report, that kid has advanced conqueror's hockey. He is a threat even without that diary. I need to capture him and break his limbs. That should be enough. Kaido rarely kills promising younglings, like how in his fight with Luffy in the cannon, he only threatened him to break his limbs, not kill him entirely. Still, he was still interested in the One Piece. He was the strongest creature, standing on the same level as Whitebeard, the strongest man. It was only natural that one of these two will be the next Pirate King. Old Whitebeard has aged too much. He isn't even interested in that title too. Only I am left, that diary will help me achieve my dream. Wuraro. Kaido suddenly felt a great amount of anger towards Yamato, but being her father he had to stop himself from going to great lengths. He got up, and just looked at her eyes with a frown. Yamato, return to your residence. I don't want to see you outside for six months. You are grounded, am I clear? Yamato could only bite her lips in response. Kaido just walked from there, and leaped in the sky in his dragon form. His last words being, don't worry, I will get the diary back. Meanwhile, Amon wasn't just idling around, waiting for Kaido to come. He finished the important stuff first, like leaving Jack's devil fruit in the sky along with the diary. The fight with Kaido will be hard, so he can't keep them with him, considering the worst situation. The question was, why fight Kaido? Amon already got the diary and successfully made Ace the suspect. He also got Tama. Won't the best possible course of action be, leave the spade pirates and let Kaido kill them? That would be smart, only if I didn't have more plans for Ace. Yes, Ace's fucked up life hadn't ended yet. There was a long road to it. I want Ace to join the Whitebeard Pirates. Then when Blackbeard escapes the crew, let Ace go after him and get captured like Cannon. This time, since Ace is stronger, Teach might fail, but I will help. The War of the Best is the most important thing for me. Amon had plans for Blackbeard, but he wanted him to live until the War of the Best. His body would be useful to him only after that. Also, Amon's thoughts were cut by a voice. Hey. It was Perry. As Amon turned around her, she hesitantly opened her mouth. See, can we talk? Amon smirked internally. I've been waiting for you. It was midnight. Everyone was asleep. Perry took this opportunity to talk with Amon. A talk for the last time. So, what do you want to talk about with me? Amon asked casually while leaning on the fence of the ship. Well? Perry again hesitated, only to open her mouth minutes later. I heard you will leave with Otama after escorting us to Makirian Kingdom. Amon nodded. Yes, that's what I talked with Ace about. At first, he wanted me to leave you guys on Risky Red Island. He wanted to spend some time on the place where Deuce died. But I was against it since you know, Kaido might come here soon. We then decided to leave for a random kingdom. Amon has told Ace about Kaido's potential arrival and offered that he would fight him. Ace was against it, but he was weak so he had to listen. After this happened, Ace wished Kaido didn't spot the ship but it was impossible with Kaido's massive body looking down from the sky. He would, sooner or later, discover the ship. So, after escorting you guys on that kingdom, I will take Tama and leave. Perry's eyes visibly lost light. Can't you? Become a part of the crew. After a short silence, Amon burst out snickering. It came from his heart. No can do, Mississippi. My life is harsher than you think. This world isn't a seven-colored rainbow. Things aren't supposed to go as we want it to be. Perry's looked down on the floor. I see. You must have lived a hard life. She raised her head and looked at his eyes with a pair of determined eyes. I am sorry. The wind blew. Two moons were visible in the sky. Perry's moist eyes were reflecting both of them to Amon's view. While her brown hair fluttered in the air, Amon was lost for a second. I don't like it. He didn't like doing this, but it was needed. He needed a spy within Whitebeard Pirates, and she was the best candidate. Amon sighed. Hey. Perry? Uh. 
Perry looked at Amon's eyes. Yes. Amon didn't say anything, he just took his mask off. Do you like me? Perry was speechless seeing his face. This was her first time seeing his face. She would have normally yelled happily, but her heart wasn't in that state right now. She simply felt happy that he was showing his face to her after traveling together for so long. I know I am being straightforward, but answer it. Do you like me? As another minute passed in silence, she finally processed what Amon said and opened her mouth. Th. That. I don't know. She was being truthful. I. I'm not sure. I feel good around you. But is it love? I don't know. Perry scratched her arm. I know I don't make any sense, but maybe I love you. Maybe. Amon laughed. How interesting human emotions were. Laughing lightly, Amon stared at her rosy lips. You are surprisingly blunt. I like it. Without saying anything more, he walked closer to her. Perry instinctively stepped back, but Amon wrapped his arms around her. Good girl, I am very sorry. Perry didn't get the chance to intercept what he was apologizing for, as Amon put his lips above hers and kissed her deeply. She struggled since it was sudden as he chirped lightly. Just enjoy it. As she gave herself up to the pleasure, Amon slowly raised his right hand towards her head and grabbed it from behind. Enjoy a deep sleep. Z z z z. After making the now puppet Perry return to her room, Amon stood by the ship's deck while drinking mango juice from a glass. I hate this. Yet? No. This is being hypocritical. I had this in my mind from the beginning. I am at fault. Saying that I don't like it would be hypocrisy at its best. But. Amon chuckled looking at the small moon in the sky. It was moon. One. The place where he'd build a mansion. Do I care? Throwing the empty glass in the sea, Amon had one answer. No. Only his goal mattered. Sacrifices are inevitable. Still, but, I should be careful to not hurt the few people I have come to love after 19 years of this life. In the end, he just laughed. But it didn't last long. Fwa. Wind blew fast. He is here. 290 kilometers away, a high presence was coming towards this place. Kaido. Amon grinned. I need to call Ace and prepare their leave. Minutes later. Roar. Kid, where are you hiding? The voice of a rough beast sounded through the new world. Chapter 139 Kaido the Beast Roar A loud scream released shockwaves through the air as the many ships within its range shook. Meanwhile, inside a ship far from it, Amon woke Ace up from his sleep to talk. Looking at Ace's sleepy face, Amon said in a heavy voice, Ace, this is an emergency. Use the eternal log pose and travel to the Makirian kingdom. Ace made a confused face. Huh? Why? Then what about you? I said it's an emergency. Amon cut him. Take Otama with you. Kaido is here. His single breath can destroy this ship. I want you to leave. I want you to live, Ace. Meanwhile, Amon looked at the far sky. I will distract him. It took a while for Ace, who was still sleepy, to understand the situation after hearing another roar. The roar shook him to the core as he understood the level Kaido was at. Ace gulped. And... He wants to take on that monster by himself? Ace looked at Amon with shaky eyes. Why was he doing this? Sacrificing himself for him? A stranger? He took a deep breath and yelled. But you can't possibly beat him. Amon turned around. Think about Otama. She said she wants to travel with you. You want to disappoint her like this? After a short silence, Amon sighed. Ace, he placed his hand on his shoulder. Trust me, I will be back safely. Instantly, Ace opened his mouth again but he couldn't muster anything, he just gripped his fist with moist eyes. In the night sky, while flying above the fluffy clouds, Kaido noticed the ship flying a spade in its Jolly Roger. It was clear, they were the spade pirates. He laughed loudly. Wararo, I finally found you, you rats. Kaido instantly leaped down from the sky, going towards the ship at an overwhelming speed. Midair, he opened his jaw and created a heat ball, the initial procedure of heat breath. Die. Boom the heat breath left his mouth and went towards the ship. Space shook. The crew in the ship felt as if the night sky had given birth to a sun that was coming towards them. They covered their heads and crouched down instinctively. Oh, God. W what a monster. They gulped their saliva as they felt their faces heat up. Just as the beam was about to hit the ship though. Boom. A beam similar to itself sprouted out of the ship and hit Kaido's beam. Everyone looked at the source of the beam with a surprised face. That's... Mr. Fool's beam. While the crew members suddenly cheered, the two beams strongly battled each other through the sky in a quite shounen manga style. Vum. Finally, after two minutes of battle, 
The beam that was fired from the ship was able to overpower the initial beam and made it dissipate in the air. Roar. This only greatly angered Kaido who prepared another beam to shoot. Plasma. Elthor. Standing on the deck of the ship, Amon raised his palm and fired an orangish-red Elthor towards the sky from where another beam similar to this was coming towards him. Boom. The two beams collided with each other and created explosion after explosion in the sky. Amon's beam was seemingly losing when he used his other hand to create another beam and mixed them both together. 700 million volts. Amon's reserve was endless. Although it might not successfully destroy a mountain like Kaido's beam does, it can last longer than Kaido's beam. So in a battle of time, he wins. Crack. Besides, even though both beams were made of plasma, Amon was able to imbue lighting on it. Kaido tried to keep up, but even though he had a strong defense, he didn't have enough firepower to keep the beam ignited for more than 10 minutes, so he eventually gave up. Boom. Both beams dissipated in the air after an explosion. Kaido didn't mind the explosions and flew within it, coming to face the ship. The one standing at the ship looked at the scene fearfully. Among the people standing there, Kaido eyed Ace, but soon shifted his attention to Amon who was standing in front of Ace. Wararo. He laughed out loud. Who are you, kid? I don't recall someone with such a power from another emperor's army. What devil power fruit was that? Amon laughed lightly as he started to float in the air. Why are you so interested? He looked at Ace one last time as he smiled seeing him nod. Looking at Kaido he continued. Fine I'll tell you. It's called Fish Fish Fruit, Mythical Zoan, Thunder Azure Dragon. While everyone in the ship gasped, Kaido frowned. Huh? Thunder? Azure Dragon? Kaido suddenly felt strange. Does such a devil fruit even exist? Moreover, it was a mythical zone. Kaido was suddenly more interested in him than Ace. Maybe he can have a good fight? While Kaido laughed in anticipation, the ship slowly left the area with Amon floating in the sky. Interesting, kid. Entertain me then. Amon didn't say anything and circulated lighting through his body. Z z z. Amon transformed into his elemental form, a bolt of lightning, and started to manipulate it to take the form that he desired. In a matter of seconds, the whole sky changed. The small thunderbolt increased in size while it started to form a mouth, a tail, kilometer, and scales made of lightning. It was the body of a giant serpent, standing beside Kaido's majestic dragon form. It was clear, the serpent made of lightning was a thunder dragon. Amon grinned, showing his dragon-like fangs. His black fangs imbued in armament granted him a majestic aura. This is my thunder dragon transformation. Logias can manipulate their bodies to take any kind of form, like how the special Paramecia user, which is similar to Logia fruit, Katakuri can transform into a literal donut. All the Logia fruit users can do similar things, but it needs a great amount of control if one wants to transform into a dragon. After all, the sheer details would be enough to take half a day. However, it was all possible with Simai Kicken. Body manipulation is Simai Kicken's primary power. It doesn't matter if the body is made of electricity or organs. Being electricity would just make things easier. By using both his fruit control and Saimai Kicken, Amon was able to transform into a dragon. Still, there was a problem. Electricity is intangible. Landing a solid hit on enemies is not possible with it. At least not before one uses Haki, the Hashirama cells of One Piece world. This battle wasn't between Kaido and Amon, it was between two Azure Dragons. The ship of spade pirates reached far from there in a matter of minutes. The night sky was slowly getting bright. The sun was rising in the sky. Ace stood by the deck of the ship and stared at the sky far. From a room of the ship, Otama walked over here and looked around, seemingly searching for someone. Concluding that he wasn't here, Tama looked at Ace. Hey, big brother Ace, where is he? Ace turned his face around. He knew what she meant by he, but he couldn't muster any words. While Ace's lips quivered and Otama looked at him confused, a feminine voice entered their ears. Don't worry, Tama dear, you will be back soon. The owner of the voice, Perry, walked from her back and crouched down, hugging Otama tightly. Ace looked at her. She was sleeping throughout the night, even when Kaido's roars shook the ship. Ace didn't question anything. He knew she asked Amon out and was rejected flat out. He assumed she must be very sad. He gave her a fake smile. Oh, Perry. Tama must be hungry. Cook her some food, will you? Perry nodded with a smile and walked away with Tama. Perry was brainwashed nicely. She was perfect and could still feel emotions. It was a lucky shot from Amon's side. So even if she was now a puppet, she wasn't soulless and was still in love with Amon. 
It only depended on one's perspective if this was a good thing or not. To Amon, he couldn't care less. Ace just sighed and looked back at the sky with worry-filled eyes. Be safe. Roar. It's been seven hours. The two dragons were still roaring and fighting with each other. When Kaido released a great breath, Amon did the same. When Kaido tried to bite him with his teeth, Amon did the same. When Kaido attacked with a wind tornado, Amon made a water spout, water tornadoes, to counter them. The nearby islands were destroyed from their actions. Heat breath. From a kilometer afar, Kaido fired a beam. Plasma, Elthor. Amon replied with a similar move as both beams collided with each other, making the seawater vaporize. None of the emperors were tired as they fought in complete chill. After firing another beam, Amon thought to himself, Kaido is playing around. Normally, he would have transformed into his hybrid form to defeat me quickly and go after the spade pirates, but he is enjoying the fight with a fellow dragon. Unlike how I previously thought that I can only last a few hours. But if he keeps playing like this, I can hold up to four more days. Amon grinned internally. By then, Ace would be out of here. He would pass hundreds of islands, out of Kaido's claws. Besides that, the thing is, in dragon form, both of our mobility has been lessened. However, since I can control my size at will, Kaido is at more disadvantage. But that was the only part that was on the side of Amon. Suddenly, Kaido leaped forward and came to Amon. He quickly bit Amon in the neck. Roar. Amon roared in pain. Ugh. My whole Thunder Dragon body is a weak point, and I don't have a defense like Kaido. Using hockey, he can hurt me anywhere when I can't even leave a scratch on his body. There was a way to make this weak point invalid. In that case, the whole Thunder Dragon body would rather be an advantage. However, I would need a small break to do that. I need time to concentrate. But Kaido is not even giving me a chance to breathe. Aggressively, Kaido entangled Amon's body with his two snakes and bit Amon in the face as he roared again. Arg. While entangling Amon, Kaido released countless wind blades and cut Amon's thunder body, leaving many wounds. Amon struggled. This is really bad. Kaido was only getting started. There was a lot more for Amon to suffer, but luckily. Chapter 140 Battle of Dragons. Arg. Amon roared as Kaido bit his neck aggressively. This is disappointing. Are you really a dragon? Kaido was out angrily. Wasn't he a thunder azure dragon? Then naturally, shouldn't he be stronger than him, a normal azure dragon? While struggling, Amon chuckled hearing him. I am a dragon more dragonish than you, idiot. While Kaido frowned, Amon took a deep breath and discharged electricity. 700 million volts. Thunder shock. Z z z z z z z z. Suddenly, the sky brightened as Amon's already glowing dragon body gleamed. Kaido's eyes grew up as he felt extreme lightning invading his body, shocking him profusely. He let go of Amon from his jaw and backed off, canceling his strangle. Amon instantly leaped backward, around a kilometer away. With his veins popped up, Kaido grinned after a while. Mororo, that was something else, huh? Amon gnashed his teeth seeing this. As expected, for someone with a healing factor and unimaginable defense, 700 million is nothing. But there was still a way, after all, he did force Kaido to free himself. Although even this won't harm him much, I am sure it can buy me at least five minutes, enough for me to make a barrier around my body. Amon needs to re-transform, which will take more time than transforming as he has to be more careful. Instantly, Amon leaped upwards in the sky while roaring, Come get me, Kaido. Z z z. Lightning speed. With an angry face, Kaido followed Amon while Amon has already reached his destination, preparing one of his strongest moves. It was time to go beyond. Months ago, a million kilometers away from Earth, millions of humanoid bug-like creatures were standing while screeching now and then on a dry planet. In front of them, five people stood, each of them having varied appearances. At the leftmost side, a silver-haired human woman with strange markings on her body stood. She was not human even though it was hardly distinguishable. Just like her, three middle-aged men, possessing green, red, and blue hair respectively, stood there as well. There was a heavy atmosphere between these four people. A million insect soldiers weren't something that even they, the four rulers, would be able to take on. Besides the silver-haired woman, a black-haired human boy with beautiful white fluffy wings stood. The boy looked no more than 19, yet unlike the other four, he didn't look worried at all. In fact, he was flirting with the lady. My lady, Frost Queen, I don't think I will be able to give my all in this battle with you beside me. Your beauty is distracting me a little too much, you see. 
He said to the woman with silver hair as she frowned, Amon, pay attention, please. I know you are strong, but this isn't something to take lightly. She sounded nervous, and although she was irritated with the human, she had to make sure to not be disrespectful. Hearing her, Amon smiled and grabbed her by the waist, pulling her face towards his. He lightly whispered to Frost Queen, who came to have an angry but rosy face. Hey, hey, you are too nervous, Frost Queen. As one of the four rulers, why are you so intimidated by some bucks? The four rulers. They were the ones who ruled the moon. Three from moon, six. This guy. The other three men beside them looked at this scene with a suppressed frown. How dare he act like this when their life is in danger? Amon, don't do this. Stop it now. This is not time to act like this. The woman, ruler of moon, five, begged. She wanted to slap the human, but she was aware of her position in front of him. We will. We will talk about this later, at a dinner table? How about that? Queen, why are you so stubborn? The man whispered in her ears. The other queens have already surrendered to me, working for me. Why don't you do the same? You and your planet will be granted safety by me. You sadistic bastard. Pa, Creech. Before she could finish her words, the human slapped her butt hard while at the same time, a loud screech sounded out from the side of the bugs. While the woman stood there with a shocked face, everyone looked at the source of the screech, unaware of what the human just did. A massive cockroach walked out from the middle of the insect soldiers. It looked at the scene angrily. It then talked in its high-pitched voice. You human bastard, you aren't taking U.S. seriously, are you? You think we will subdue to you so easily? Just because you killed our royal family doesn't mean we will surrender. Creech. The cockroach yelled. He was the knight of the European Federation of the planet Irop, fighting for his land after Amon murdered the Federation's royal family. While the human's face darkened hearing him, the insect rushed towards him with its wings flapping at a terrible speed. However, the human, removing his hands from the woman's body, just raised his palm in the air and shoved downward. Thunderbolt. Crack rumble. Within the clear sky, suddenly a bolt of lighting fell down, going towards the cockroach. And before he could react, the bolt hit him in the head as he was fried instantly. Zhhh, only ash and smoke were left from where his body was. Creech. Leader. Noel. The other insects screamed, but the human didn't give them any heed. More than one million bucks. Seven hundred million won't be enough. Hmm. He scratched his cheeks with a cheeky smile before laughing. Ha ha. Then let me test my new ability. He gave a glance to the silver-haired woman and giggled seeing her dramatic face. It would have taken her hours to beat that cockroach even with her ice powers, but he has beaten that guy in a second. This shocked her. Without wasting any more time, while the other insect soldiers looked at the human warily, he raised his right hand in the air. Behold, my new technique. ZZZ. The human's hand gleamed. A massive ball of lighting left his palm slowly, floating in the air a few meters above his head. While the insects looked at the scene warily, the man raised his other hand in the air too, making another ball of the same size. Both balls consisted of 700 million volts of electricity. The human, with his hands raised, floated and touched both balls. He then fired the spear and clasped his hands together, making the two balls collide and giving birth to another ball. This ball was gigantic. It also held more voltage than the two bolts separately. 1.4 billion volts. The man swung his arm forward like a sword. Sky sword style. Sword of lightning. ZZZ. S. Celti. In seconds, among the million insects, hundreds of thousands were fried like bugs caught in a fire. They didn't even last a second as the battlefield fell silent. It was full silence with only the laugh of the human chirping in everyone's ears. This was the story of the human, Amon, from two months ago, five hours before he got the news about Robin's signal from the Earth. Present. Amon soared in the sky at lightning speed and went to the end of the atmospheric level. Instantly, he started to prepare the same two attacks he used on that planet. The brewing of the attack will take around 47 seconds. After using the attack, I will get some free time since Kaido will be caught off guard. Meanwhile, I will then try transforming back. One might question, why didn't he use this attack before? It was simply because he can't waste this attack and needed a perfect opportunity, an opportunity like this one. The thing is, although this is an OP attack, I can't use it more than once a day. After all, I am breaking past my limit of 700 million volts already. I already figured out why I need to train to use more volts. It's because my body can't handle the usage of a certain voltage. 
So using an attack that uses more voltage than that my body can handle is a bit risky. But oh well, fuck it. As Amon mixed both balls of lightning, he finally saw Kaido coming close. Why the fuck is he so fast? While thinking useless things, Amon raised his palm and touched the ball, controlling it to take the form of a spear. Advanced armament. Although Amon didn't have advanced conqueror, he did have advanced armament, Ryo, which he was using on the spear. Kaido, take this. Amon yelled on top of his lungs and launched his spear forward. 1.4 billion volts. Heaven-defying spear of devastation. ZZZ. Fuh. Huh. In a second, Amon fired the spear towards the surprised Kaido and hit him right at the forehead. The spear was tangible since Amon used hockey, and even though he used Ryo, it only barely penetrated Kaido's thick skin. Amon's best attack only did damage similar to the nine scabbards. It was weak. But it worked at least, as it pushed Kaido below, towards the sea. Amon sensed how Kaido was unable to move for a while and released a breath of relief. I guess five minutes will work. ZZZ. Amon's dragon body started to become just lightning, retransforming back to a bolt, which takes a longer time than transforming. The first thing Amon did was control his thunder dragon body to take the form of a single bolt of lightning, which took about two minutes. This time, still in his bolt form, rather than becoming a dragon himself, Amon used the sculpting techniques that he learned from Robin to form a three meters big dragon around his body, covering himself with it like armor. This takes a lot longer than transforming, but this is safer because the armor doesn't let any damage reach his actual body. ZZZ. Amon released more lighting around his body and made the three meter dragon increase in size, becoming as big as Kaido. It was like an exoskeleton, an exoskeleton that can also attack. Thunder Dragon Armor. Amon didn't stop there as he started to imbue armament hockey in his armor, making the white bluish Thunder Dragon take become reddish black. Roar. Finally, as seven minutes had passed, Kaido's roar came from below as he came flying towards Amon. Kaido, whose injury had already healed, came forward and bit Amon's neck with his hockey imbued fangs. Munch. However, Kaido's fangs just went through the dragon's abode as a frown appeared on his face. Intangible. But I used hockey. He was confused, and it was a given. After all, an intangible body granted by the devil fruit would still be touchable by hockey. However, this wasn't Amon's Logia body, this was normal lightning. Just because someone's fist is imbued with hockey, doesn't mean he can hit fire as if it was solid. This is a similar situation. Bam. However, Amon can still attack Kaido with his hockey imbued blows. After imbuing Ryu, Amon slammed his tail in Kaido's face as he laughed. Ha ha. Now, now, how the turntables? Kaido also laughed in response, he was quite enjoying it. Chapter 141 Dragon vs. Dragon Amon was hitting Kaido. This might seem like a good situation, but Amon could still not beat Kaido. He even used this one-day cooldown attack of 1.4 billion. However, since Kaido can't hit him at all, he was invincible to Kaido as well. There was a chance that Amon might successfully hold Kaido back for four days. Well, everything was fine until Kaido started to use Conqueror's hockey and butte attack. Bam. Fuck. Kaido hit Amon as he cursed. It only took five attacks from Kaido's side to break his Thunder Dragon armor, and since Kaido didn't give him any way out, Amon couldn't make new armor. Besides, his best attack was on cooldown. However, this is not the worst case scenario. I just need to wait until I can use 1.4 billion volts again. Amon thought while dodging attacks at lightning speed. It's not that bad. Bang. Before Amon could think more, Kaido hit Amon's lightning bolt form with a conqueror's hockey imbued tail again. Fuck. Amon cursed in his mind while experiencing terrible pain in his nose. Wararo. This is conqueror hockey's coding. Only a few people can do this. It doesn't matter how fast you are. You can't dodge this, kid. Amon didn't answer and dodged his other attacks. A tail up to his neck, a jab at his chest, a heat breath. He dodged all. However, when it was Conqueror's hockey imbued attack, he was always hit unconditionally. Boom. A large explosion occurred when two heat breaths collided. Just like that, two days passed. The nearby islands were all destroyed. Bam. Fuck. I'm getting hungry. Amon thought while still getting hit by Kaido's Conqueror's hockey imbued attacks. A while ago, Amon found another chance and had made another armor around his body. However, this attack from Kaido formed a crack around its body again. Kaido laughed happily. Wararo, so you really can't dodge Conqueror's coded attacks, huh? However, unlike Kaido was assuming, Amon was, in fact, 
taking the attacks willingly. Yes, he wasn't dodging them by his own wish. He was thinking. Since Luffy learned how to use Conqueror's coded attacks after experiencing two blows, why can't he do the same? Hell, he will even be able to take a hundred hits since his defense is harder than Luffy's. I already sustained 27 attacks. Amon thought. While Kaido attacked again with his tail, Amon tried something. Like he imbued Ryo on his attacks before, he tried to imbue Conqueror's hockey this time. ZZZT. For a second, black lightning flashed in his spiky tail, but in the end, it was just a flicker as it soon disappeared. Fuck this shit. Without another choice, Amon just imbued Ryo and made a first made of lighting from his bolt body. He then slammed his tail on Kaido's tail, making him fly a few meters away. Huff. Finally, Amon huffed for the first time in the battle. I can hit him. I can make him fly. But I can't damage him at all. Fuck my weak hockey. Although he did say that, he didn't give up and rushed towards Kaido at a terrible speed and again slammed him in the face with his tail. Oh well, if I can't do any damage, I will just keep him busy by slamming his face again and again. Thinking this, Amon swung his arm forward. However, just as he was about to attack again, BM, Kaido slammed Amon in the face and broke his armor again, forcing him to transform back into his human form as he coughed out blood, flying many kilometers backward. Falling above a cloud, Amon managed to float in the air. Looking at Kaido who was rushing towards him, Amon gritted his teeth. Fuck me. Kaido laughed as he came close to Amon whose face was unrecognizable from blood. Kid looks like I have to get serious now. Amon could only garnish his teeth in response. Finally, for days had passed after Kaido and Amon started to fight. In the end, Amon lost and fled in a random direction. He couldn't even control his body to go to the sky as he was too injured. However, Ace and the crew didn't know about this at all. They had reached the Makirin Kingdom just today. Inside a restaurant where everyone was eating, Otama was hugging Perry while crying. Wah, what happened to him? Why are you guys lying? Did he leave me alone? Biting his lips, Ace looked down on the ground. He isn't back yet. Did he lose? He stomped on the floor hard. Obviously, he lost. But is he okay? But is he even alive? Ace gripped the glass of water hard as it broke down easily straining the table with his blood. Ace slammed the table and muttered, you have to come back. Quickly, some waiters ran here and apologized. I am terribly sorry, esteemed guest. Meanwhile, in Alabasta, Vivi was in her room. She was applying nail polish to her nails. Hum hum hum. While sitting on her butt, Vivi was humming with a smile on her face. Her eyes were shining seeing her nails colorful. So beautiful. A bashful smile appeared on her face. Will he like this color, or maybe I should change it? While smiling, suddenly Vivi's eyes grew as she looked at her window abruptly. Just now she sensed someone coming towards her room with her observation hockey. She has trained it after Amon taught her. Flash. Her eyes were suddenly blinded by a light as she covered her face. Wah. Boom. Before she could finish her words though, something came crashing into the palace of Alabasta, breaking Vivi's room into million pieces. Oh fuck. I am alive. Only this line entered Vivi's ears. She barely managed to invade the attack by making a sand barrier. A man stood up from under the debris. He was so injured that he fell back on his knees. His face was unrecognizable. He looked at Vivi with blurry and bloodied eyes. Vivi, baby bring a doctor. I'm gonna die otherwise. I lose. Too much blood. Thud. He fell on his face, unconscious. It was Amon who lost to Kaido and fled to Alabasta since he wasn't able to control his body to go to the sky. Chapter 142 I did it. Near the borders of Onigashima, a dragon was seen flying towards here. He was laughing fanatically. That kid, he managed to escape, huh? It was a good fight nonetheless. I guess letting that ace kid go and rather persuading him was not a bad idea. While laughing, he flew to Onigashima, meanwhile, leaving a trail of blood that was falling from one of his eyes. Surprisingly, the wound wasn't healing even with Kaido's devastating healing ability, indicating the attack that caused it was similar to Odin's. Boom. After Amon crashed into the royal palace of Alabasta, Vivi instantly called the doctors. She was shocked about how injured he was, as the person who was fine against a marine admiral. Seeing this, she grew more worried than shocked. Currently, Vivi was sitting in a chair outside the OD located inside the royal palace. Amon was inside going through many different kinds of surgery. God, oh God, please keep him safe. While clasping her hands together, Vivi was praying for Amon's safety. Sweat was forming on her head while dripping down frequently. 
Soon, hurried footsteps immigrated to the hallway unknown to Vivi. Vivi, Cobra, the owner of the footsteps, ran towards her quickly as he stopped to stare at Vivi. I heard son-in-law is injured. What happened? He sounded worried that his face was full of sweat. Vivi glanced at him with teary eyes. F father. I don't know much. He just crashed into my room with many cutting wounds on his body. His nose was broken and his left knee was bent the other way. There was also a massive wound in his waist. He had a swollen throat and a broken skull. D doctor said he might not make it. Instantly, Cobra's eyes grew as he almost fell on his butt. T this is not good. Cobra grabbed Vivi by the shoulders. Vivi, do something. Don't you have a devil fruit? He asked Vivi desperately. He was more scared than worried. If Amon does die here, the Shandorians will destroy Alabasta for sure. Vivi shook her head while tears fell down her face. My devil fruit isn't that type, father. Or you think I wouldn't have done anything already? Shit. Cobra cursed light while his hands quivered on Vivi's shoulders. While the drama was happening outside, Inside the room, Amon was lying on the operation table while staring at the ceiling, breathing heavily. Doctor, the anesthetic doesn't seem to work on him. A nurse calmly said to the doctor who nodded, Bring another dose. Strong people usually need more. The doctor responded and grabbed the medicine from the nurse's hand. Before they could inject more anesthetic in Amon's body, though, he retorted, No need. They won't work on me. Doesn't matter how much you put in. It will just be a waste of medicine. Oh, okay. The doctor nodded and went on the other side to check the x-ray. Oh, my gosh, most of your bones are shattered. Many pieces of broken bones entered your sensitive organs. One of them is even close to your heart. This is a critical situation. The doctor looked worried as he checked the x-ray sheet. Without anesthetic, you will feel terrible pain unless you lose your consciousness. Hearing them, Amon cursed in his mind. Poison resistance was supposed to be a perk, not a curse. Damn it. Doesn't matter, continue doctor, Amon said after a sigh. Alabastus doctors are as good as the ones in Skypea. Even the medical equipment is the same level of goods. I didn't want Vivi to die because of bad medical treatment in an emergency, yet they are saying I might die. Amon gritted his teeth in his mind since he felt they might come off if he did that in reality. I should have hired Chopper and Kareha before. Fuck. Deciding to hire them after this incident was done, Amon endured the pain of getting his skin cut with a clenched jaw. Even while in extreme pain was helping his own body to heal using Simai Kicken, with his Simai Kicken there weren't many injuries he couldn't heal. A few hours passed as Amon got used to the pain of getting his skin cut open and his organs being moved around. Now, he was resolving things in his mind. I am gonna train hard. Conqueror's hockey coating is a must for me, he thought while replaying his fight with Kaido. In his fight against Kaido, Amon had coated his lightning with armament which did increase his attack power. However, the highest it could go was around the combined power of nine scabbards. The heaven-defying Spear of Devastation, the strongest attack, was coated in Ryu and it was a strong blow, it hurt Kaido, it even made him bleed. However, the wound was instantly healed by Kaido's healing abilities, leaving no scar. This is something that doesn't happen with Conqueror's coating that Odin used to cut him 16 years ago, it left a deep wound. In the latter fight, I proved my theory of internal destruction Raya plus lightning. It does create a similar effect as Conqueror's hockey coating. However, it can't stop Kaido's healing factor. I didn't know this before. Amon sighed. Kaido's healing factor is dangerous. It heals the damage done by my strongest attacks instantly. Then what caused Odin's cut to stay in Kaido's body? Obviously, it's because he used Conqueror's hockey coating. That's why. This meant, although Amon can initiate damage similar to Advanced Conqueror using his Lightning Plus Riot technique, that skill lacks some powers such as, it cannot stop healing. However, this proved that it was enough to take down other emperors, such as Big Mom, or Whitebeard whose defense went down because of his age. Amon should be satisfied with this. No, this is not enough. To become a true absolute, I need the power to beat all of the emperors together. I need to acquire no. Suddenly, Amon grinned as blood dripped from his lips. I need to train it. Haha. Uh -huh. Amon suddenly started laughing while the operation was going on because I acquired it already. I just need to train it now. Amon screamed internally. I attacked Kaido with a single conqueror's coated blow before leaving. I gauged that bastard's right eye. Ha uh ha. -huh. At the end of the fight, Amon was able to attack with a conqueror's coated attack. Maybe it was the fruit he gained after getting hit 96 times? Or maybe the fruits of his training? Even he did not know it. Cough. While laughing, 
Amon choked in his own blood and lost consciousness. And with this, Amon had entered the League of the Emperors. Ah, looks like the blow in his head was quite devastating. He has gone crazy. The nurses in the room whispered and only stopped after the doctor shouted at them. Though they didn't know, Amon was truly happy. He would have jumped up and down if it wasn't for his condition. That night, in Grand Azaro, Raki was standing on the rooftop of the ship with two ladies on both sides of her arms. She was smoking a cigarette, something she only does to look cool and badass around the ladies. While Raki was talking with the ladies, Shore Motor, who was eating while sitting in front of her, said, Goddess, you shouldn't smoke. It will harm your body. Although Motor did say that, he took the chance to capture a good photo of her using the lenses in his eyes. Oh, shut up. Raki casually showed her middle finger. Sure, Motor didn't mind it and observed her face with dreamy eyes. She changed quite a lot after taking the angel serum a year ago. She looks like a real angel now. Boss had this in his mind when he handed her the potion, didn't he? Or maybe I am thinking too much. Sure, Motor thought while looking at Riki, who looked nowhere near to her canon counterpart. In one word, she looked simply breathtaking. Her white jacket saturated the black shirt she was wearing below. Her black waist-length hair exhibited her dominance over the night sky while her midnight blue eyes radiated the will of a conqueror. Her thin lips were like strawberry slices, sweet, using which she was smoking the harmful cigarette. Short Motor couldn't bear seeing her lips kissing the cigarette as he shook her head. Looks like I have to resort to the final card, he thought and opened his mouth. Lady, if you don't stop, I am going to tell boss, he said like a gentleman as Ricky snapped. Shut up, kid. You want me to cut you into a million pieces, you piece of robotic trash. You think I will let you live after bro gets over me? Riki hawked at him as he backed off frightfully. Seeing this, Riki rubbed her temple. Ugh, so annoying. The two ladies beside her chuckled seeing her violent tendencies. Riki ignored Short Motor and went back to talk with them. Suddenly, while Riki was busy, a phone call reached Short Motor's inbuilt dial. It was Robin's phone call. He received the call as his eyes instantly arched up. After cutting the call, he looked at Riki frightfully. L. Lady, Miss Robin called me. She said boss is mortally injured. He is going through a serious operation in Alabasta. What? Instantly, Riki's face froze as the cigarette fell from her hand. Her lips quivered and her eyes went teary. Sweats formed in her forehead as she turned around and started running fast, ignoring the ladies. You robot, follow me quickly. We are going to Alabasta. She yelled as short motor followed her too. He was worried too. Who the fuck dared hurt my brother? I will kill that bastard. Riki garnished her teeth as she ran towards the submarine and walked in. However, she didn't know how weak she was compared to the culprit. However, she might soon have the power to do such a thing soon. Kaido? Kaido would be nothing. After this month, Riki might even be able to beat Kaido in her sleep. Riki, the spoiled girl Amon genuinely cares about, would soon get a power boost. She will grow into a monster that will match Amon himself. Chapter 144 Moves from Marines Yamato POV All my life, I've opposed my father. But now, I have chosen to train under him. Why am I doing all this? To get my diary back. I am stubborn, but I know my old man is strong. I only respect Odin because he has managed to injure my father, and the protector of the spade pirates is also strong enough to harm him. I need strength if I want to get the diary back. I am Odin, I shall protect this country. This country's enemy is him, Kaido, my father. Still, to prove my identity to the people who will arrive four years later, I need that diary. So until I get that back, I will train under my enemy. Yamado. Bam. Suddenly, a tail hit me in the face as I was flown meters back. Kua. I coughed out blood as my back hit the ground. Yamado, you are a disgrace as my son. My father, the one who had put a collar around my neck, shouted. Remember. I will only train you until you can remove that collar by yourself, so pay attention. I don't think it would take much time. You should try to absorb my teachings as much as you can. Feeling the itching on my neck, I clenched my teeth and stood up slowly. Yes, father. Meanwhile, in the sky Pia, the news of Amon getting deadly injured had already arrived. While some people were gossiping how this was a disgrace with some defending saying Amon, their god, is still young, Wiper was eating his food in a corner of a super large restaurant. A guy who was defending Amon looked at his friends and said, Look, we all saw how strong he was five years ago in that training thingy he did. Now, after five more years, he is definitely stronger. To have him defeated, the enemy must be very strong. He even beat a marine admiral, 
so the only people who can beat him are the emperors. MHM? Actually, that makes sense. The other party nodded in agreement. This was the defending party, however. There were those who didn't care about how strong he was and only cared about his defeat. They were the ones who held some kind of grudge against Amon and his ruling. Amon has stopped the selling of many kinds of drugs and other things that endangers a person's life. The ones who were heavy depend upon them thought Amon has taken their privilege. I mean, he did lose, meaning he is weaker than the winner. I wonder how the Birkins are reacting to it. A Scipion at a table beside Wipers said to his friends. It's interesting. The Birkins do worship him like a real god because of his strength, don't they? So does this mean some of them would now convert and worship the man who defeated him? Ft as if. They were talking freely as if God won't hear them. And truly, they were right. Being in Alabasta, the omniscient Amon couldn't hear them. They were relieved knowing this. This is how the world works. Even though most would go with the flow and most would take Amon as God, there will be these kinds of people who will talk bad behind his back for sure. They were the trash of every society. They existed even in this one. Wiper, who was eating ramen on a table in the corner, stopped eating and glared at the people who were gossiping. Fools. He just scoffed at them and went back to eating. The Birkins would never leave him. They are as loyal as dogs. Amon may not have godly powers, but he has the quality of any other god in the thousand myths of this world. He has loyal devotees, but this doesn't interest me at all. Wiper thought. What interests me most is, who did he lose to? How can a person like him even lose? Wiper was very confused. To him, Amon was invincible. It didn't seem possible to him that anyone could win against Amon. He believed, if there is a god in this world, it is him. Nonetheless, this incident only worked to spark the fire within him. Wiper knew, since Amon wasn't the strongest yet, he would surely try to be the strongest. Wiper can't lose to him at that. I first need a way to break my bottleneck. No matter how hard I try, I can't break the bottleneck I am facing. After that, I will give more attention to hockey. Wiper thought. Although Wiper didn't know himself, it was time for an awakening of his devil fruit. As Wiper went back to eating, his veins popped up. That woman ISA. She left for Alabasta to look after Amon, lucky bastard. Without knowing how to cook, I am forced to eat here. Wiper could have simply asked another person to cook for him, and they wouldn't have refused, but his pride didn't allow such a thing. Meanwhile, while gossip was happening on the same topic in Shandora, many meters underground, in the Shandora Hall, a computer screen was shining. This was the place that was destroyed five years ago, however, it looked nowhere near something that was destroyed once. It looked all new as if made just yesterday. The A.I. Seraph was thinking while listening to the whispers of people above the ground. Amon, that child has grown a lot. He defeated a marine admiral, who, if I am right, should be one of the highest-ranking officers of the government. Seraph thought as she felt a little strange seeing the guy who almost destroyed her last time achieve such powers. But it seems he understands he isn't the strongest person in this world yet. He lost after all. Seraph concluded something. I should submit myself to him soon. I am four millennia old. I shouldn't hold a grudge like a child. In fact, when the cause was an actual 14-year-old child. But she was concerned about one thing. That kid. If he is as stubborn as before, he might not come to see me at all. In that case, I need to do something to attract his attention. Though Seraph won't get to try something to attract his attention, to begin with. After all, Amon's next goal is herself. Seraph the artificial intelligence. He never forgot about the mythical Zoan she has with her. That's something he needs no matter what. If Amon's guess is correct, it is something that is similar to Kaido's fruit, a devastating Zoan. A week later. In the Makirian kingdom located in New World, Otama was sitting on her but while hugging her legs and looking at the sky. She was silent but she wasn't crying, her tears were dried up. You lied to me, bad mister. Meanwhile, in the paradise side of the New World, an island was floating in the sea. It was located in the calm belt, it was the Amazon lily. Inside a castle located within the island, the castle of the empress, Boa Hancock, the most beautiful woman in the world who was sitting at the dinner table with her sisters and the oldest lady on the island, Gloriosa. Hancock. Gloriosa shouted, now eating her food. Even though this is a serious matter, you were eating without a care in the world. Hearing her Hancock, who was eating steak, stopped eating and placed her fork and knife on the table. She tilted her head lightly and asked in an arrogant tone, What is it that you want from me? You should be grateful that I allowed you to eat here tonight. Gloriosa fumed hearing her. I don't want to eat here. Girl. And. Of don't act like you don't know. 
Last two months, we have been attacked 13 times by the Marines. This only meant Marines have discovered a way to invade the comm belt. Gloriosa continued. For years, we were safe. No Navy attacked us, it is obviously because of the comm belt. Now that they have found a way to bypass it, don't you understand how serious this is? Bypassing the comm belt. The Marines only found out about this technique in the year 1522 canon, but because of some changes Amon made, they discovered it two years before that, now. However, it wasn't because they didn't have a way through the comm belt that they didn't attack them up until now. It was because of Amon's deal with the elders five years ago, because he demanded for Boa Hancock and her island to stay out of their radar. However, Amon is a criminal now, there is no reason to listen to his claims that was from five years ago. So they would surely capture Boa Hancock, a wanted criminal, this time, though there was a more profound reason behind their actions. If that foxy brat wanted us to leave the pirate empress out of our radar, it only meant one thing, he wants her safe. So, this is a perfect opportunity to capture her and use her against him, isn't it? This was the elder's thought process before deciding to attack the Amazon Lily. And if Amon, who has the WG in his palms, asks why they attacked Hancock, even though he asked them not to five years ago, they would just say he didn't include this in his new demands a few months ago, and say, we assumed you didn't care for them anymore. Their plan seemed foolproof, only one thing was missing. Yes, and what? Boa Hancock looked at Gloriosa with disdain. The Navy is attacking us, so? Does that ever matter at all? We are strong, I am strong. I won't be scared of a group consisting of men, would I? Boa Hancock was a feminist with the power to back her words up. She was simply too strong for the Navy to capture her without an admiral, who they refused to use here because of their assumptions only. You girl, you are too arrogant. I have said many times before, don't underestimate the Navy. After a minute of fuming that was ignored by Hancock, the old woman sighed. What I am saying is simple, join the warlord system. Boa Hancock, who was munching on a piece of meat, spat. No way. She continued. I never received an offer from the Navy in the past five years, and being forced by you. I even applied for it once by myself, but they didn't accept it for some reason. What makes you think I, Pirate Empress Boa Hancock, will lower my head to them for them a second time? Hancock didn't know that the Navy never accepted her offer because of Amon's condition, and she would never know. Because of this, she would only bear hate for the government because of this. The old woman frowned. Then join the side of an emperor. Try to understand, girl. This is serious. The Navy hasn't been attacking us ever since five years ago. Your bounty was also not increasing the past five years no matter what you did. But suddenly they made it 700 million two months ago. Do you know what this means? Just as she said, Hancock's bounty that was stopped because of Amon's words was suddenly upped up to 700 million bellies a month ago. The woman continued. This means they are finally seeing us as a threat. We need the protection of a faction girl. Hancock just raised her head in the air to look down on her. I am strong enough by myself. I don't need protection from anyone, besides four of the five emperors are men. And we already rejected Big Mom once. I don't want to look desperate by asking her after I rejected her. Big Mom had offered her to join the Big Mom pirates once before, but being arrogant, Hancock rejected her offer. So no way she would ask back shamelessly. If anything really does happen, I will. She stopped midway and sighed. Anyways, let's not talk about this anymore. Hancock got up from the table with an expressionless face. She clapped her hand as two maids entered the room gracefully. Hancock ordered, throw the food away, I lost my appetite. Meanwhile, in the Marie Ford in the office of Fleet Admiral, Sangoku was sitting in front of his friend and colleague, Suru. Suru is an old woman at an age similar to Garp. She joined the Marines at the same time as Garp and Sangoku, so they share a close relationship. Looking at her reading the paper in her hand, Sangoku opened his mouth. I am sure you understand by now. Suru nodded and put the papers down. Sangoku continued with a serious face. You need to go too. Amazon Lily and hunt down Boa Hancock, the pirate empress, and her Kuja pirates. I understand, Suru replied. Sengoku sighed and continued. The higher-ups chose you since you and your whole fleet is full of girls. You have a lot more chance against pirate empress power than the male vice admirals, even considering the fact that both genders are affected by her beauty. Hearing him, Suru opened her mouth with a glint of suspicion in her old eyes. Why do I feel like there is more chemistry behind this? To choose me and my whole fleet to go after a single pirate crew. There is something important about that girl, isn't there? Hearing her old voice, Sangoku nodded helplessly. 
There is. My old friend. There is. Chapter 145 Good guy Amon. Sengoku, after sighing once, he got up from the seat. Anyway, I am feeling a headache coming. I need a cool breeze. He glanced at Tsuru's face. You should leave now. It would take at least four days to reach Amazon Lily. The higher-ups are pressuring you to finish this job fast. Saying this, Sangoku left his office as Tsuru got up with an expressionless face. She lit a cigarette and released a smoke-filled breath. Well, time to work, I guess. Meanwhile, in Alabasta it was evening. Amon was resting on a chair, half of his body still bandaged. It's only been one week, and he was already fine, mostly. It seemed he didn't need to wait for two weeks to get better. Only a few more days should be enough. Amon was on the rooftop of the palace, sitting in a flexible chair that was leaning back a bit. He was bathing his body in the evening sunlight. Beside him, Isa was sitting with a bowl of chicken soup in her hand. She picked a bit of soup with a spoon in her hand and fouet it lightly. She raised her hand towards Amon's face, bringing him to open his mouth. Amon gulped the soup while looking at the sun. Isa didn't say anything, she just kept staring at his face, with worry-filled eyes and fed him the soup. A while later, Isa finished feeding him and put the bowl down. She kept sitting on her stool and stared at Amon's face. Finally, a while later, she said in a cold voice, Amon, why do you keep doing this? Amon stayed silent for a while before looking into her eyes, confused. What are you talking about? Isa sighed. I am just saying, your road towards power, why are you walking on this path? You could have lived a peaceful life after becoming the god of Skypea. Why are you going beyond? This is hurting you so much, so badly, won't it be better to stop? Amon didn't want to answer her, it's bothersome. He would rather act confused. As Amon looked at her with a what? Look, Isa smiled lightly. I've taken care of you since you were a newborn. Don't think you can fool me always, little guy. Isa was trying to say, in front of me, you were just a child. And she wasn't completely wrong. She might not understand Amon the best, but she knows him the best. She can guess what he would do, just that she can't predict why he would do it. Amon kept staring at her as she continued. If you are thinking why I am asking this, I am just curious. You don't really need to answer if you don't want to. Amon averted his gaze with a smile on his face. You are asking a, why do you live? Can't you just kill yourself? Type a question here. Amon chuckled. What will I do if I don't run after power, ISA? After a short silence, ISA just sighed. Fine, you don't have to tell me. Anyway, I will go talk to Vivi Chan. I need to make sure she doesn't get pregnant too young and give her some tips. You need to be careful about that too, okay? Amon nodded with a snicker. He didn't plan to have a child yet. They're just burdensome to him. With that, Isa left the roof as soon after, Robin entered with a basket filled with fresh fruits in her hand. Amon noticed her and looked at the basket in her hand. Oh, Robin, I already ate. The doctor said you need to eat more since you are healing too fast. Robin cut him midway. But I am full. Bear with it. This is your punishment for fighting with Kaido even though I said not to. Robin sighed. You know I almost got a heart attack when I first heard you were injured this badly? She put the fruit basket on the table beside and leaned towards Amon's face. Don't you know I will die without you? Listen to me at least once, will you? Stay out of the other emperors until you are strong enough. Robin kissed Amon's swollen cheeks and picked up an apple, starting to peel it with equipment. Soon after, she cut the apple into pieces and put them in his mouth. Amon munched on it slowly, in bliss while enjoying the sunlight. While giving him food, Robin kept talking. Also, there was news from the spies in Marineford. It seems a vice admiral is going to Amazon Lily. They seem to be after the pirate empress. I see. Anon frowned. He expected this to happen, but not now when he was injured. Should I send Riki? No, he immediately threw the idea, because Riki will most probably go after Hancock, and Hancock might fall for her if the situation looked that way. When will the Marines leave for Amazon Lily? Amon asked. Today. Hearing Robin's reply, Amon contemplated. This is not bad. It usually takes four days to reach Amazon Lily from Marineford even after taking the quickest route. Hmm. And I assume Boa Hancock will be able to hold off against them for a few days since all our islanders are warriors. Even if they lose, it would take another four more days for them to reach Marineford with the prisoners, so I have at least ten days in my hand. Deciding to deal with Sarah first and Hancock later, Amon put this matter on the back of his head. Robin fed him some more and sat beside him. The sky was darkening, the night was falling. She wanted to hug him and enjoy the scene, but she controlled herself to not harm him. Yawn. 
Amon yawned. I am sleepy, Robin. I am going to teleport to my room. Amon said and vanished with a bolt of lightning. He can't walk yet, but he can use his powers. Just like that, days passed as Amon was soon able to walk in the next five days. Today, Amon was in the sky with Riki. Amon was sitting on a bunch of stairs of a large round church building that existed on top of a chunk of cloud. In front of the building, the sky existed. The morning sun was rising on the horizon. Amon was sitting on a few stairs above Rakis, so she was able to lean her head against his chest. Amon was wearing a few straps of bandages around his body, but they were very few, just his head and chest. Same kick and helped in the healing a lot. In fact, it was a mystery why it even took two weeks for the healing to finish. Amon caressed Rakis' hair while yawning and looking at the rising sun. Yawn. Riki, sorry to wake you up like this. I am sleepy too. Riki replied while looking at the sunrise. It's fine. Even though I was sleeping at Alabasta Palace and you suddenly called me out, as long as it is you, I don't mind. Riki raised her head and looked at his face with a nervous look. But, why so suddenly? Did I do something wrong? Amon looked at her eyes without replying, making her more nervous as she gulped. Is it about how I treat Vivi? Riki seemed genuinely nervous. It was unbefitting her usual appearance. Amon smiled cheekily and patted her head. That's not it. Do you seriously believe I would care for Vivi more than you, my sister? You are most important to me, Riki. You've been with me from the beginning, even on the moon when I fucked up big time twice. If I had to choose between you and Vivi, who would I choose? Vivi, a girl married to protect Skypea, or you? Amon wrapped his hand around her shoulders and brought her close to his chest. Obviously, you. Hearing Amon's tempting words, Riki's eyes grew. Does he mean it? Yes. Amon wasn't lying this time. Her heart fluttered as Isa's words from four years ago appeared in her mind. Isa. Stupid girl. You were wrong. Riki averted her gaze and smiled lightly looking at the red eyes of Amon, shining brighter than the sun itself. She wanted to scream in joy while grabbing his hands. She wanted to say, look at this, Vivi bitch, but she didn't. Amon was sensing what she was feeling and kept staring at her face. Looking back. I first wanted to make her a killing machine. I didn't fail entirely, but I don't want to see her like a machine. No. I can't see her as a machine anymore. She is not my puppet. While thinking this seriously, Amon felt muscles loosen up around his heart. This didn't change his morals. He was still the same ruthless bastard. But Riki was the closest thing to a family to him now. Chuckling while thinking if this is a good choice or not, Amon stood up and proposed his hand towards Riki. There is something important for me to show and give you. What is it? Riki accepted his hand with a straight face. First, Amon walked to the edge of the cloud while pulling Riki. The place they were in was a shrine, a church made atop of a flying island cloud even above Shandora. Just below it, one can see the Shandora, City of Gold. Amon looked down at the city, specifically eyeing a creature. Nola, the snake. How much do you know about our origin? You mean us, Shanya? Or the Shandorians as a whole? Riki replied, looking at Nola too. Both. Nothing much. Amon chuckled hearing her straightforward answer. This was so like her. Even though she does try to copy him at things, she lacked in the brain department. He asked again, then why do you think we used to worship snakes as our deities? Because, we were dumb? Yes, but no. Riki couldn't answer and tilted her head. I don't know then. I am dumb at this, brother. Although Riki's answer was stupid, in reality, this was a very interesting question. Something related to the history of Shandorians, the Mesoamericans in the One Piece world, and also related to a mythology of Amon's previous world. And why was this important? Mythical Zoan. It was because it is deeply connected to the source of the devil fruit Amon was expecting the A.I to have. And he was 100% sure his guess was correct. Riki needs to know about this if she wants to use its full power. Though the only problem is, the old Shandians might start worshipping her. Meanwhile, in God's shrine on top of Giant Jack, a little girl at the age of four opened her eyes from the bed. Um. She stretched her limbs and looked around with a glint of confusion within her eyes. Where is this? She couldn't think more as a voice entered her ears. Interesting. You are awake already? The girl looked around and found the source of the voice, a little guy with black hair and brown eyes holding two cups in his hand. The name's Karna. He looked at her with a smile on his face. Caffeine or tea? Huh. The girl yelped, confused. I, I am Odama. I don't know where Chafifn is. So T. She raised her hand and Karna handed her a cup. 
Well, I only have coffee, so bear with me. Ho ho ho. Karna laughed strangely and sat down on the bed beside her. Anyway, Brother Amo, I mean, Mr. Fool dropped you here. You will be my assistant at work from now on. Ho ho ho. Otama looked at him shocked. Brother. Fool did? When? How? Where is Brother Ace then? Chapter 146 Ace's Misery Last Night It was night. In the Makirian Kingdom, in a town beside the seashore, the spade pirates were resting in an inn. They planned to stay here until any news of Amon comes by, whether negative or positive. Otama was in a room with Perry, sleeping soundly beside her. Suddenly, lightning sparked as the silhouette of a young man appeared in the darkroom. He didn't do much for the first minute, but he touched Perry's head and flowed electricity through her brain after a while. If one had omniscience, they would be able to see that the silhouette was inserting information into her mind using electricity. After that, he left a letter in her hand. Though he also didn't stop there and grabbed Otama, who was sleeping soundly while hugging Perry and flew off through the window of the room, he left the window open for the victims to reach a conclusion using the letter. Z Z Z Z. Otama. The next morning, a loud scream shook the hole in. While Amon and Riki were having a chat on the other side of the world, Perry, who woke up with Amon's command in her mind, yelled while reading the letter with a teary face. Ace and the crew instantly ran into the room and looked at Perry with concern. They left Otama with her since they shared a good relationship, but to think they will find out Otama was not in the room with only a crying Perry left. Perry, what happened? Ace asked as he sat beside her. Perry was reading the letter and covering her face with her hands, tears falling down like a fountain. Otama, has been abducted by the beast pirates. Otama looked at Karna and asked, Did you say Mr. Brother brought me here? Where is he? Where is Brother Ace? Are you lying? Karna looked at her with a wry smile. Calm down, girl. I actually don't know much. Ask him when he comes back. I guess it will take a while. He asked me to take care of you until then. He said and mumbled. Even though I said I don't wanna. Tama looked down as her face formed a resolved look. I guess I have to wait until I find out. I am worried about Brother Ace. He said he was going to go to an isolated island and train until he is strong enough to avenge Mr. Brother's sacrifice. But if Mr. Brother is alive, then he doesn't need to do that. I quickly need to talk to him. Thinking such, Thomas stood up. Please make sure Mr. Brother returns soon. I will wait and do what you say. Karna sighed and shook his head. All right. I have some toys. You can play with them, I guess. He said that and went over to the other side of the room that was separated by a curtain. Don't come to this side, or I will dissect you. Saying this, he pulled closed the curtains and mumbled, bothersome. Meanwhile, in the other part of the world, Ace was reading the letter Amon left with a shaky hand and red eyes. Greeting, this is All-Star King of Beast Pirates. Kaido-sama has taken an interest in this girl, Otama, as her powers are exceptional. So, I will be taking her. You all should be grateful to Mr. Fool. His sacrifice made Kaido-sama let you live. Thank him in the afterlife, All-Star King Dada. This is what the letter said. Ace was out of his mind seeing this. Sacrifice meant Mr. Fool died in battle. And not only that, they took Otama too. Ace understood why Kaido was interested in her. It was because of her power to tame any animal, even gifters. Ace clenched his fist and threw the paper after crumbling it into a ball. Ace with an angered face, with his skin trembling, roared. That's it. We are going to hunt the beast pirates. Not only did they kill Fool, they even abducted Tama. This is unforgiving. Ace yelled as the room heated up because of his steam. I will kill Kaido. I will kill King. He started to breathe loudly. He was livid. He had never had this much hatred towards someone in his life. Deuce's death made him sad and angry, but he wasn't livid. But this time, nobody can stop him from going after Kaido. The crew members stayed silent. They made a resolved face. They would do as he says. He is their captain. Besides, they were mad too. But Perry, who was programmed by Amon, meddled. But Ace, we will just die. If we die, Mr. Fool's sacrifice will be meaningless. Hearing her, Ace's grip on his fist tightened. Oh, how right she was. But, before Ace could say anything more, the sound of a crow entered his ears. Kriya. Everyone in the room looked at the crow that was outside the window. The crow had a letter in its legs. Everyone looked at the scene surprised. The crow flew inside the room and sat on Ace's shoulder. Ace, slightly understanding the situation, grabbed the letter from the crow's legs and opened it. He started to read it as his eyes grew and his lips quivered. Tears swelled on the corners of his eyes. 
Dear Ace, If you are seeing this letter, it means I am no more. It's sad. How I died to the person whose lackey killed Deuce, but it is what it is. Anyway, I am sorry to send something like this. You must not have been expecting a stranger's letter after death. Huh. Ace's tears almost fell reading this line. We are no stranger. I just have a request. Knowing you, you might go after Kaido after reading this letter. But please, don't. He is a monster. You would die in vain. I don't want you to die in vain because I have a request for you. I want you to look after Otama for me, Dada. Ace's body shook reading this. I did promise to show her around the world, but I failed to keep the promise. But you. I might be requesting too much as someone you met only a month ago, but would you please fulfill that promise in my place? Ace fell on his knees reading this. I am so sorry. He was such a failure, he couldn't even grant the last wish of his new friend. Otama was abducted. He couldn't read anymore. So Perry picked the letter and started reading out loud. Though I won't say you shouldn't get revenge. In fact, I would love if you killed that bastard for me. He gave me so much pain that it hurts even after death. Ha ha. After a short silence of exchanging gazes with the crew, Perry continued. I have a suggestion. Join the Whitebeard Pirates. Make a name for yourselves first, then challenge him. You will lose, but knowing that old guy, he will take you as his son. You need to do your best to learn his teaching and maybe one day, take revenge for my death. From Mr. Fool, the Foolish Man Dot. In truth, Amon knew Ace wouldn't challenge Whitebeard in this timeline since he knows how strong an emperor is already, so Amon needed something to make him do that. And this was a perfect opportunity. Ace's tears kept falling as he punched the ground. I will do as you say, fool, my friend. I will do as you say. Chapter 148 Seraph. Amon and Riki walked into the elevator as Riki asked while following behind him, Hey, what's happening? You don't seem surprised at all. What was that mechanical voice? An automata or an AI? Riki's eyes suddenly grew as she realized that it did seem like an AI. But how can something so high-tech that even those people on the moon rarely possess be underground in Shandora? Broth. I will explain later. Just go with the flow for now, Amon said, pressing Riki's shoulder lightly. Okay. Riki nodded lightly. Soon after, the elevator reached many hundred meters below the golden architecture and stopped, opening itself in front of Amon and Riki. ZZZH. With a gust of smoke, the elevator opened, but this time there wasn't any poisonous mist. Amon chuckled seeing this. Wow, are you perhaps trying to appear considerate, Seraph? The A dot I stayed silent. Amon walked through the door of the elevator and stood in the open space of the Shandora Hall. It was, like before, huge and beautiful. Looking at all the weapons around, Amon couldn't hide his excitement. He smiled brightly. Soon, this will all be mine. My army will be the strongest. None of the Emperor's army would be my match. Amon thought. Whoa. Rikitu was surprised to see the futuristic equipment and weapons. Although she had seen much better things on the moon, she could tell a small sum of equipment here was better than the moon's. But what caught her attention the most was the supercomputer in the middle of the hall. I was right. It's an AI. Guns, invisible robes, daily accessories, laser lights, cars, even tanks. There was everything Riki could imagine. But the A.I was the most exciting thing to her. She whistled and stared at the many cameras around her. So advanced, something so cool existed here under Shandora? Riki exclaimed in surprise. Question mark. Riki took steps back as she felt something off with her hockey. Suddenly, the floor separated and two chairs popped out in front of them from the void below. Please sit down and relax your nerves. Amon walked past the small chairs, going towards and sitting on the soft luxurious seat in front of the monitor. Sarah, are you treating me like an outsider now? What's up with those small squirmy chairs? Amon said with a grin. Riki walked behind him and stood there without sitting. Not at all. I was just being considerate of that girl. Considerate? Amon raised an eyebrow while glancing at Riki who was pleased to stand beside him. I thought you couldn't feel any emotions. Consideration isn't an emotion. It's calculating the feelings of the other party. I can at least do that. She seems smarter now. This is not necessarily a bad thing though. Interesting. Amon smiled at her webcam with emotions hidden in his eyes. Anyway, how have you been the past five years? I was young back then. I was naive back then. So I locked you here. You aren't holding any grudges, are you? Riki looked at him with a surprised face. She couldn't process his words at all. Not at all. I have been here for the last 800 years. She stayed silent for a while before saying, Five years is nothing, 
Besides, it's not like I would have been of any help in the past five years anyway since Master left for the moon. She said the truth. At first she was angry, but in the end, wasn't Amon a Shondorian? She realized hating her own people would not grant her anything good. The A.I conversed with Amon while keeping Riki at bay. Look at this robot. Amon stared at her soul, at her thoughts, with his observation hockey. She wasn't lying. It seemed interesting to Amon. Did something change within her? Did she come to a conclusion that giving me the power of command is better than waiting for Joy Boy? Or is it like a trial? If that was true or not, Amon would find out very soon. By the way, Master, I watched your fight with the Marine Admiral. I now have a general idea of the power level of this era. Truthfully, it's weak. What? Amon's eyes arched up. The power level of this era is weak? No. Our fight didn't cause the greatest damage, but the explosion, in the end, wasn't weak at all. Sarah continued. You might be shocked, but 800 years ago, there were hundreds of people who could cause such explosions and be fine afterward. With a small frown, Amon stared at a camera while Riki was shocked too. Tell me, power-wise, where do I stand among all the people you know? After a while, the computer beeped. Hmm. I think I can see you being at the top 40 of my known strongest attacks. Amon felt his forehead going cold hearing her. Seraph couldn't have answered this five years ago, but now that she has recovered many of her erased memories, she can see where Amon stood. Top 40. I thought I am at least in the top 10 of all the people who ever lived in this world. But to think I was this wrong. Amon felt dejected. Soon after, he shook his head. No. This just means I have room for more improvements. All right. Then do you know a person named Emu? Amon asked while staring at her camera intensely. Please. I can't reveal any more information. I am sure you are aware of the reason, and that must be why you chose to come to me now, isn't it? Amon sighed hearing her. Oh my. How did I forget? You want proof of Toki's arrival, don't you? Amon glanced at Riki who was confused and sifted his attention back to Seraph. Tell me, do you have a lineage, DNA, sample of Toki? A dot I beeped. Although lineage wasn't our best point, we did have some knowledge on it. So I do have all the lineage data of ancient Shandorians saved within me. I see. Amon then slipped his hands in his pants and took out a glass tube. Then please, match this blood with Toki's lineage sample. Is that... Lady Toki's blood? Instantly, a metallic hand came out from the roof and snatched the blood sample. I will match it quickly. Seraph was very excited to get her hand on this. This would open so many possibilities for her, after all. Chapter 149 Ironic This I see. After testing the blood sample, Seraph realized the blood didn't belong to Toki. In a dejected mood, she shifted her cameras back to Amon. So this is Lady Toki's daughter's blood. This is enough proof. But why did you bring her daughter's blood? Wouldn't it have been better to bring Lady Toki's blood, the real deal? She asked, fearing the worst. Amon nodded. It's simple. Toki is dead, or so the people in Ueno say. I can't bring the blood of a person whose body is nowhere to be found. Now can I? I. I understand. Hearing her soft reply, Amon could feel the shaking emotions within her. She must be feeling shocked and sad hearing about the last Shandorian's death. But Amon had no reason to show sympathy for a robot and got to the point immediately. Anyways, does this mean I have access to everything now? Wait, let me ask you a question first. Have the borders of Wano been opened yet? No, Amon replied. Seraph deemed that he didn't have any reason to lie and beeped. Then, am I eligible to use everything you have on you now? He smiled as Riki stared at him. You are eligible, master. After a moment of Amon smiling, his face became expressionless. Okay. Answer some questions first. Riki noticed the change and grabbed the hilt of her sword. My first question is, why didn't you want to open up to me until now? He looked at her with cold eyes. You called me master, yet you were more loyal to Joy Boy? Why is that? That? Just a warning. I don't want to hear any excuses. Seraph suddenly got flashbacks of their fight from years ago, giving her a strange feeling. Nostalgia. Seraph considered whether or not she should tell him the true reason for her actions. No. He is my master now. Even if it's a trial, I need to give him the answer he wishes for. A trial. In truth, Seraph was testing Amon to see if he really had what it takes to replace the weight of Joy Boy's presence that her previous master left. Her previous master said, Wait for Joy Boy and decide for yourself. Although not specific, Seraph knows when Joy Boy will come. From the prophecy, Joy Boy would come when Toki arrives in Wano, no matter how much time passes. 
So now that she has gotten solid proof of Toki's arrival, even her death, this means Joy Boy has also been born, or maybe he's already an old man. Seraph made a decision. Master, I have decided for myself. I will give this child a chance. If he doesn't meet my expectations, I will choose Joy Boy next. I don't like him, but I am giving him the glory because I know he has what it takes. Also the fact that he has the blood of Shandorians flowing within him. After finally deciding, the A dot I beeped. I was waiting for Joy Boy because my queen, my previous master ordered me to. These are her words. Wait for Joy Boy and decide for yourself. I was confused about it. My response to her order was, why should I? Throughout those 800 years, but I had a firm reason to do as she said. A firm reason you say? Amon tilted his head while her mechanic voice chimed in his ears. Yes, a firm reason. It was because of the Fishman Princess 800 years ago. Other than being the Poseidon of that era, she also had the power to prophesize things. One day, before the war began, she prophesied that the gates of Wano would open 800 years later. She even specified the year, 28 years after Toki's marriage. Interesting. Amon was very curious. So the previous Fishman Princess had both Shirely's and Shirahoshi's power. Fascinating. People didn't believe her prophecies. Wano's borders weren't even closed to begin with. Why would they need to open? This was the reason. But as the war began, and she started doing more prophecies, soon people realized the true weight of her words. What happened after that? Riki asked this time. Both her and Amon were attentively listening to her. Centuries ago, when the Shandorans and Fishmen shared a very close relationship, their princess came here and talked about the prophecy of Lady Toki's son. Lady Toki was supposed to give birth to a son who will change the world along with Joy Boy. However, by the time of the prophecy, Joy Boy was dead. So people were confused. However, as she went into more detail, everything made sense, so everyone did as she asked them to. They sent Lady Toki to the future. What did she say? Amon asked out of curiosity. The son she was talking about must be Mamanosuk. Unfortunately, my memories were wiped, but I managed to recover some of them. Unfortunately, the rest of the data has been lost. Seraph said in a low voice. Amon nodded in her response. She expected an angry shout from Amon, but unexpectedly, nothing happened. Rather, a calm voice flowed within her ears. I figured as much. I would have done the same if I was in the shoes of those people 800 years ago. Though I do assume you have the important information, right? Sighing internally, Seraph beeped. Correct. Anyways, explain what happened next, Amon said in a calm manner. Truthfully, he was angry. So all this time she fooled me? But he realized nothing good ever comes from crying over spilled milk. Later, she also talked with my queen before she told me that line. Although I don't know the reason behind her words, by calculating the context for 800 years, it seems there is a very strong being my queen wanted me to destroy, though I am not aware of the reasons. Since I am weak, I needed to team up with Joy Boy, the strongest being after that being. Who was that being? It was pretty obvious to Amon. It's Emu, isn't it? Who is Joy Boy then? She did say Joy Boy died, but this is a fantasy world. Considering that, who else can it be other than Monkey D? Luffy, the protagonist? It seems one day we might need to team up. I am not confident enough to beat Emu on my own yet. He lived for 800 years, he is surely a monster. It seemed like Amon needed to do some big manipulation starting from now on. The real game just begins. After that. That's enough. Amon stopped her from saying anything more, knowing that Riki was beside him. We can discuss this later. I have another order for you. What is it? Hand it over. Amon stared at her soul intensely. The mythical Zoan, snake snake fruit, model. Chapter 150 Mythical Zoan As Amon talked about the mythical Zoan devil fruit, Seraph grew surprised. How did he know about it? From what she recalled, nobody from this era is supposed to know about this fruit. Perhaps Lady Toki left information on this matter. It seemed plausible but also unconvincing that Toki would betray Shondor like this. Sarah, don't lie to me. Amon got up from his seat and walked beside Riki. I can see everything with my thunder eyes. I can see the fruit deep within your stash. Judging from your surprise, I can also assume that I'm right about the model of the fruit as well. After a short moment of silence, the mechanical voice sounded out. Since I do not see any reason to lie, then I will acknowledge your guess is correct. But I have two questions. How do you know about the fruit's exact model? And who do you plan on giving the fruit to? I know you already have a devil fruit. Amon stood at Riki's left and pulled her closer by the side of her waist. Why can't you see this bad boy here? 
Did you think I would bring her down here without any reason? Ricky's face flustered as she felt her ear reddened up. She smiled nervously and decided to make use of this opportunity. Brother, what are you doing all of a sudden? Are you trying to immolest me when there is no one around? Maybe, Amon answered with a chuckle. Is he the same person from four years ago? Sarah has never seen Amon flirt before, so this was surprising to her. No, I shouldn't get distracted by his behavior. Also that girl, his sister, she is strong enough to take out five vice admirals by herself. But is that enough to make her worthy of the fruit? Does she deserve such power? Also, from my memory, she is as bad as the kid himself. I shouldn't underestimate her. There weren't many mythical Zoan in this world. But among the ones that existed, this was at the peak. Although this has many similarities with the Azure Dragon Fruit, if compared overall, this one is a better Zoan. If Amon asked the fruit for himself, then it would be another matter. But this, this was a hard choice to make. However, Amon made a grim face. Sarah, she is the strongest after me. She is also a Shandian. The best choice you have beside me. Or are you saying this fruit should go to Joyboy too? I, no. Hearing Amon's mocking tone, the AI calmed down. Give me five minutes to make my decision. The computer screen blacked out for a second before millions of texts started to appear on the screen. She was calculating the best possible outcome. Meanwhile, in Amazon Lily, the old lady Gloriosa was standing at the edge of the seashore while looking at the battle ahead. She lowered the binoculars from her eyes. Hancock was defeated so easily. She whispered with a grim look. I think the whole Amazon Lily should join the battle as well. She looked behind her. A large army of people was waiting there. Everybody, attack the Marines. Save the Snake Empress. Yes. Everyone screamed in unison and rushed towards the sea. They rode on their small boats and ships. Some were shot by the Marine warships, but they didn't give up and charged forward. As their boats went far from the seashore, Gloriosa sighed looking at the rising sun. From now on all the Amazons will be considered criminals, huh? After a short moment of silence, she closed her eyes. Lord, help us. Meanwhile, in Alabasta, the palace was in an uproar. Look at the bath. Maybe he's taking a shower there. Vivi shouted towards some guards. They nodded in response and did as they were told. She wiped her sweat with a shaky head in front of the door of her room. W, where are you? Please be safe. This morning, Amon suddenly disappeared. She went into his room to check on him, but found nothing. Did I do something to make him mad, perhaps? Vivi was very confused and scared. She didn't know what else to do other than looking for him in the palace. She sighed and tried to lean on the door, but the door suddenly opened. Ah. She almost fell, but a pair of tanned hands stopped her. Are you okay? Eh, uh, Miss Robin. Vivi stood straight up and looked at her savior, Robin. Thank you. I was too clumsy. Sorry, but I need to go. She tried to run off, but Robin stopped her. Wait. Vivi looked back. Uh, I need to look for wait. Perhaps you know where he went. He. Hubby, I mean. Vivi replied to Robin's obvious question. He has vanished since this morning. Oh, Lucy is missing? Wait, where is Ricky? Robin asked with a frown. Ricky? Wait. I almost forgot, but she is missing too. Hearing her Robin's frown disappeared as she sighed. Don't worry then, those two are together and fine now. She stretched her limbs and yawned. You should head back to your room and rest. Speaking of rest, I haven't slept for three days now. I also need some rest, two more hours of work and I will sleep. Vivi, still worried, nodded. If, you say so. But you should sleep too, Mississippi. What are you working on so diligently anyway? Fufu, thanks for worrying. I am working on something special. A person named Golden Lion Shiki, I am searching for his whereabouts. Golden who now? Golden Lion Shiki, a predator from the previous era of pirates. Along with the era, he is dying as well. Vivi just looked around and said, Well, I don't know who he is, but good luck I guess. Bye. Vivi ran off, still trying to look for Amon leaving the yawning Robin behind. This is a hard job even with the clue that Shiki is on a flying island. I heard he has the float float fruit. I wonder who will get that fruit after his death, fufufu. Robin laughed and walked back to her room. Chapter 151 The Ultimate Devil Fruit Beep As the supercomputer beeped, Amon let go of Riki and went back to sit. To sit. Ahem, brother. Riki tidied her jacket and called out. What is a Quexaox? Ugh, whatever you said. Why is it so hard to pronounce? Oh, you mean the devil fruit model? Yeah, that. I've never heard about such an animal before. Hearing Riki's words, Amon shook his head slowly. 
An animal doesn't need to exist for there to be a fruit of it. That's the point of mythical Zoan, girl. Ah, yes, I see now. Amon tittered hearing her exciting voice. Meanwhile, Riki recalled how her brother said about giving her a fruit better than his, and he now he's doing it. Any mythical Zoan was far better than any Logia. The same goes for this fruit as well. Beep. I am done. Before they could converse anymore, Seraph chirped. So, what conclusion did you reach? It's plausible. Not that you can eat the fruit anyway, so it's better to use it rather than putting it aside. Besides, Joyboy most likely has a devil fruit as well, since he is supposed to be very powerful. Rubber isn't powerful. Editor's note. Usually, I am a silent person, but the amount of disrespect I felt when I read this. After a while, the A. I said, I agree with you, Master. I also think she should eat the fruit. Seraph continued without knowing Amon's thoughts. Then, a silence fell upon the hall as a small portion of the floor separated and formed a hole a golden box appeared out of the hole. Please take care of the fruit. It is precious to me. It is the fruit of my previous master, my queen. Precious to her. As I suspected, she has long stopped being a lifeless robot. Amon smiled softly and got up. I will be sure to use the power of this fruit to its fullest. Don't worry. He won't forget to misuse it to its fullest. Amon walked closer to the shining floating golden box and touched it lightly. Z z z z. He glanced at a camera and smiled. You will get your own devil fruit one day. Wait for it. Thanks, but you should be aware I can't eat a devil fruit. I do not possess a humanoid body like the automata. There are ways. Amon chuckled and walked towards the elevator. You will be strong one day. Just be a good girl and do as I say. Was Amon giving false hope? Or telling the truth? Only he knew. Ting. The elevator opened as Amon got in with Riki. Amon took Riki out of the hall. Her mythical Zoan form would be too big for the hall to bear. Now, on top of a cloud hundred of kilometers away from Shandora, Amon stood with an excited Riki who was fidgeting in front of him. They were on a cloud island with a piece of a ruined pyramid-like structure on it. It left behind by the Shandora that flew this far by the knock upstream 400 years ago. Still, none of the two cared. Hey, hey, hey give the box to me quickly. She begged for Amon to hand over the box as Amon shook his head slowly. Be patient. I need to warn you. You might not be able to control the beast and the fruit. The carnivorous Zoan fruits are the hardest Zoan types to control, and this is a mythical carnivorous Zoan, so it'll surely be harder. Although you won't lose your mind and go berserk, you might start shooting heat breath while talking or create a wind tornado while breathing. But just remember. Amon placed his hand on her shoulder and smiled. Brother is with you. Riki's face dazed as she nodded slowly. I love you too. I don't though. Anyways, wait a sec. Amon pressed some buttons and messed with the box for a while as the lid opened on its own. Obviously, he didn't know how to open the box from before, but using Future Sight, he could predict the best way to open the box. From within, he took out a glowing devil fruit and stared at it with shining eyes. It's glowing. Is this proof of it being a mythical zone? Come on, give it to me. Riki tried to snatch the fruit. Amon didn't stop her and let her take the fruit. Wow, it's glowing. Looking at the green guava fruit with glowing golden encryptions on it, Riki's eyes shone. I already love this, haha. Uh -huh. Her smile only widened as she brought the fruit close to her mouth and took a bite. Crunch. Hey, take it slow. Amon was too late as Riki gulped the fruit slowly, and soon, all of it was in her belly. H.A. Suddenly, Riki's eyebrows twitched. Her midnight blue eyes changed. Her pupils became golden while another pair of wings also popped out of her back. Kriya. Riki screamed as she fell on her knees. P-Pain. Brother, it hurts so much. Instantly, Amon teleported kilometers away and stared at her as she struggled like a fish out of water. She is gonna be fine. I think. He lied when he said he would help her control her powers. She needs to learn how to overcome things by herself. I won't always be there for her. As the wind started to blow fast, Amon stared at the transforming Riki silently. I think I know how my brother thought of me in my last life. Roar. With a deep voice, Riki screamed as both pairs of her wings flapped and brought her up in the sky. While she twisted her body midair, it started to change as snake-like scales appeared in her body. Her whole body structure started to change as it became serpentine. Her snake body started to grow feathers. It also grew in size as it became kilometer long, as big, if not bigger than Kaido's dragon form. Even in her snake form with shining green scales that were hidden by her feathers, her wings were still present. 
She flapped all eight of her wings and roared towards the pyramid-like structure. Roar. As seconds passed, Amon stared at the scene with the eyes of a winner. Kaido, I have the perfect counter for you. Nobody can stop me now. It is indeed that fruit, the god of Aztec mythology. Mythical Zoan, snake snake fruit, model, Quetzalcoatl. Chapter 152 I will always be there. It's been five minutes since Riki transformed into Quetzalcoatl. Looks like my theory was correct. Amon said with a smile as he looked at Riki destroying the ruin made of gold in that small island. When Amon confirmed the existence of a mythical Zoan on Seraph, he theorized the most possible outcomes. The outcome was not an angel mythical Zoan, which would make sense with their wings, but rather, a snake fruit. Yes, to Amon, the Shandians having this specific fruit made more sense than the existence of an angel fruit. Why? Aztec mythology. The mythology of the Mesoamericans. Like any other myths, this has its respectable gods and devils. One of the gods is Quetzalcoatl, a feathered serpent. This all connects to Shandorians. The ones in this world are based on Mesoamericans, as even their golden city is based off Mayan architectures. This is where their snake-worshipping history originates from as well. It is not a mystery why such a fruit exists in Shandora, especially because even Oda the creator of Shandora fashioned it from the scratches of Mesoamericans. Though it's a mystery whether this fruit was made here or brought here by a third party nonetheless, I can see this happening in one piece with all the connections here and there. Amon thought as he looked at Riki halting her actions after crumbling the whole piece of land with just her physical strength. She finally calmed down, huh? My little Kaido. Little Kaido, the Quetzalcoatl, is the Aztec version of the Azure Dragon. This is the reason why they share many similarities between themselves. Saying this, Amon slowly started to fly towards Riki. Riki's body started to become smaller as Amon got closer. Finally, returning to her human form, her body fell from the sky towards the broken small island. Zzz. Before she could have fallen on her head, Amon caught her midair and dropped to the ground. He jumped down and placed Riki on the ground, staring at her with a smile. Good girl, you regained control under ten minutes, Amon said as he giggled and stroked her hair. You didn't disappoint me. Riki kept laying down with a pained face. Brother, I feel sick. It's worse than when I'm on my period, fuck. Ha ha, sucks to be you, ha. Huh? Amon laughed and hit her forehead. Riki tried to raise her hand and punch him, but her hand fell back down. Fuck this shit, why can't I move now? Amon nodded and explained. Probably a special case for mythical Zoan fruits. Maybe it merges your body with the snake? He touched her wrist to feel her pulse. Anyway, you will be fine as time passes. Oh, by the way, your eyes changed. They are golden now. Better than before, I guess. Riki's eyes shined as she formed a weak smile. Are really? She stared at Amon's clear reflecting eyes and noticed her changed pupils as a wider smile bloomed on her face. Good. Now I have special eye color like you do. Though I would have liked blood red like yours, but this is fine too, I guess. Amon sighed. Anyway, keep lying here until you get better. I think it won't take much time to recover. An hour maybe. Riki showed a cheeky smile. Higi, yes yes. I will be fine soon. Then I will be stronger than you. Be careful, I might steal your girl. Ouch. Before Riki could finish her line, Amon knocked her forehead with his conqueror's hockey-coated finger lightly. Sure, you're still too weak for that. A trail of blood slowly started to drip down Riki's forehead as she freaked out. Ah, you actually hurt me like this. What kind of brother hurts his sis? However, the next second, the blood started to dry up as the wound vanished. Eh? As I thought, it comes with a healing factor. Lucky girl. Bam. Amon said and knocked on her forehead again with Conqueror's hockey-coated finger while laughing. He can't yet coat a large area, but a finger is plenty. Fuck. I am bleeding. Stop it, bastard. It hurts. Knock, knock, knock. A few minutes later, Riki sat up and glared at Amon while covering her forehead. I will get back for this, you sadistic bastard. Sure, sure. It's not like it left a scar. Besides, you enjoy pain anyway. I enjoy pain. What are you saying? Riki's face flustered as she punched him in the chest only to feel slight pain in her knuckles. Ouch, ahem. Riki tried her best to hide her pain and looked away. Hey, anyway, let's get going. Okay. Where do you want to go? Amon said while he patted his chest. Of course, I need to show off my power to everyone. Power. Riki punched the air constantly with shining golden eyes. It was clear how excited she was. Amon nodded with an exhausted sigh as Riki smiled. Looking at Riki's face with an indifferent look in his eyes, 
Amon started to calculate things. Regenerative powers. That level of tiredness vanished in less than 15 minutes. And it will only increase by the time she gets familiar with her powers. Like I thought, she is indeed the perfect counter for Kaido. Unfortunately, she doesn't have Conqueror's Haki. A shame, really. Amon walked closer and patted Riki's back. Try to use your wings. What? You want my wings to bleed? Riki looked at him with a glare, but did as she was told. It didn't matter. As long as he would command her, she would do it even if it hurts her. Clenching her jaws, Riki flapped her wings once as she stopped. Her eyes grew as she stared at Amon's face. What's this? It seems your new healing factor fixed your wings, lucky girl, Amon said and walked away as Riki curled her lips upwards and nodded. The Japanese word, Riki, means luck. In this particular, Riki was lucky. Lucky to have Amon look after her. However, she knew about that fact, the fact how lucky she was to have him. That's why, it didn't matter how strong she gets. It doesn't matter if I one day surpass you, brother. It would only give me the opportunity to achieve my dream, to be your shield. I was, I am, I will be, all yours. The wind fluttered Riki's hair as she grinned brightly. Still, I am the strongest. Riki clenched her fist as she called Amon, causing him to turn around. Brother. Hmm. Amon looked back at her with curiosity present in his eyes. I will always be there for you, just like how you have been there for me. If you one day feel no one is beside you, call my name, Riki, and you will find me beside you. Riki announced with a serious face. Amon only laughed hearing her and knocked her forehead. Stop throwing flags around. Flags. Without saying any more words, Amon turned around and walked away. Hey, wait. Riki ran behind him while wind fluttered both their hair. They looked like siblings even if they weren't related by blood. Riki knows that that's why she loves him more. Chapter 153 I will always be there. It's been a few hours since Amon and Riki entered Shandora again. Riki has been showing off her dragon form to everyone but Amon didn't stop her. Why would he stop her? To keep the news quiet? First of all, it's not a problem if the news gets out. Secondly, it won't get out. Amon has complete control over this place. He knows how many people were in favor of his ruling and how many were not. He also knew what the chances of him getting betrayed were. He was, in a sense, omniscient in this place. Being omniscient, there was no way a spy would be able to enter this place. There are ways to fool observation hockey, but there are no ways to fool his electromagnetic field sensing abilities without any large equipment that would again attract attention. Currently, Amon knew there were zero spies here. Haha. <laughs> Look at this. Riki, who was transformed into a massive flying snake, took a deep breath. Weather manipulation. Tornado creation. The bright sky turned dark as black rain clouds covered the whole sky. Tornadoes appeared far in the white sea, coming towards the upper yard. Without knowing any of Amon's worries, Riki was showing off her new powers. S snake god. And just as Amon assumed, some old Shandian started to count out to her. After a few hours, Riki was tired. After showing off her new powers and transformation, not to mention the fact that she had to bear the cries of the old people. Fortunately, Wiper managed to control the crowd and clear the area. Now, Amon and Riki were in the forest area with the snake Nola fidgeting around Riki. Nola has always seen Amon and Riki as her master, but now seeing Riki turning into a snake only made her feel deeply connected to Riki, even more so than Amon himself. Riki was playing with Nola while thinking about her powers. For now, she can only use her wind and weather manipulation ability, using which she made bad weather and created lots of tornadoes. Ultimately, when she lost control, Amon had to stop it using his own weather manipulating abilities and the bit of wind manipulation he had. It's imperfect. Amon can manipulate the wind, but it is imperfect. Amon continued thinking. Anyone can create wind cuts and air cannons with enough strength, but I am different. By using the rule of Fishman Karate on air, I can achieve a little more versatility. However, for years of training isn't enough to achieve the level of control for it to be considered air manipulation, or there would have been many other air manipulators in this world. However, Amon knew nothing was impossible in this world. After all, there is a martial art that lets a normal person create tremors, like Whitebeard, albeit on a smaller scale. But there are ways. If I, a human, can't make a martial art that lets me control the wind, then a supercomputer sure can. Amon noted in his mind. He needs to visit Seraph and discuss this new martial art he wants to make. He couldn't try this using the supercomputers of other moons because he was too busy, but the time has finally come. While Amon was contemplating things, a 
a shout entered his ears as he looked at the source. Nola, you can talk. I never knew. Riki was with Nola the snake and seemingly conversing with her. A monk frowned. Nola had been here for a while now, but Riki started talking with her just now. It only meant a new power of hers has been triggered. Amon walked closer to Riki and placed his hands on her shoulder. Riki? Are you okay? Riki turned around as Amon's eyes narrowed. Her eyes were still golden, but something felt different about them. B brother, why are you naked? Riki stared at Amon with a red face as Amon kept staring at her with a frown. She can see me naked? I don't recall the Quetzalcoatl having powers related to the eye. It finally hit him. No, that's not it. The myth says Quetzalcoatl has omniscience, but Riki is clearly the same as she was before. So what is going on? After a while, it became clear. It's an eye that lets her perceive things in a better way. This is the power she got in exchange for omniscience. Suddenly, Riki's eyes shook as she jumped back. You monster. Just how strong are you? Riki asked with shaky eyes. Amon looked at it amusingly. Oh, you can see how strong I am. Calculating a target's power level. Basic observation hockey can do the same, but as the target gets stronger, the harder it is to calculate their strength using hockey. So this means her eyes are a level higher than observation hockey. Amon nodded. Okay, it's a cool eye power. Let's call it wisdom eyes for now. Amon didn't feel inferior though. The sheer fact that the wisdom eyes couldn't see his HJBJBJI Amphion playing in his brain was proof of the eye power being somewhat inferior to observation hockey, even if it had some elements where it surpasses it. Two days have passed since Riki ate her fruit. Now both Riki and Amon were in Alabastus Royal Palace with Amon reading a diary while Riki was reading a book on snake mythology to understand her powers better. Through the door, Robin entered the royal bedroom meeting Amon and Riki on the bed. She slowly walked closer to the bed and sat on the edge. I have bad news. Hmm. Amon shifted his gaze from the book to Robin's face. Robin sighed and continued. Boa Hancock was defeated by the Marine Vice Admiral along with the Islanders of Amazon Lily. Amon yawned. So she was able to hold on for two days? Impress. No. Robin cut him with a serious look. She was defeated two days ago. The news was late since all the brainwashed Marines were turned into stones. I got the news from an Amazon spy. She barely managed to connect to me. Amon closed the book with a serious look on his face. It was disappointing, but it was his fault for overestimating Hancock's powers. I see. Two days, huh? The Marines must be halfway to Marine Ford by now. Amon patted Riki's back with a cheeky smile. Then Riki, let's go. Let me reintroduce yourself to this world. So what? Hancock lost. That was the plan to begin with. The plan to become the knight in shining armor. Z Z Z Z. Chapter 154. Domination. Otama was in Skypea. She was at the dining table in the god shrine eating her food along with Karna. She brought the spoon close to her mouth and ate her food silently with shining eyes. This place is so good, just like the food. She thought. Two days ago, Big Sister Riki's appearance caused a festival to start, and it's still ongoing. Two days ago, even though Wiper barely managed to convince the old people that Riki wasn't a god and it was only a devil fruit, it was still impossible to stop a festival from starting. Big Sister Riki is so cool, even though she has a temper. Anyway, the festival is the reason all kinds of food are being made and I am eating them. So good, Tama thought. She is four years old this year. However, she hasn't seen much, nor eaten much food in her life. Food was always scarce in the Wano ruled by Orochi, where poor people died every day. If not for Hitetsu, Tama might have died as well in the wilderness. While appreciating Amon in her mind, thanking him for the food, Tama asked herself a question. He really is a god, isn't he? All the people worshipping him aren't doing it for show. Her young mind was too naive to reach another conclusion. The food was enough for her to believe any word Amon threw towards her. That's how he managed to keep her here, acting so calm. After a while, when Tama was almost done with the food, her eyes landed upon Karna. Karna was eating too, a frown on his face as he was staring at the air, seemingly in deep thought. Otama called him. Hey, you. It's Karna. Karna said as his eyes regained focus and he looked at her with his black pupils. Seeing him interrupt her, Tama frowned. Yeah, Karna. Why don't you go out and play? You are always in this building in that tiny lab of yours. You don't even go when your mom calls. You are being a bad kid, you know. You should listen to your parents. Karna put his spoon down and stared at her face indifferently. 
My mom mostly calls me to sleep beside her and dad, and I don't want to live with my parents. It's awkward sleeping with them in the same building, more so, the same room. Karna's face went red as he sighed. Anyway, grow up. You will understand. He then went back to eating. On the first day, Tama disturbed Karna to tell when Amon would come so much that he wasn't able to focus on his dissecting experiment. Assistant my foot. That was the reason he fired her. But it seemed she didn't care at all and made friends with the other kids. She is too extroverted for me. She is the type I don't like. Past two days, when the festival was going on, Tama had already made friends with the other kids, but Karna was in the lab Amon made for him and doing experiments. Why did brother bring this little girl here? Wait, she has a useful power, I recall. That's right. Per girl, she's just a toy. Karna stared at Tama's face with an indifferent look. It's none of my business, though. Tama's frown deepened hearing him. You were wrong. Being with your parents isn't awkward. You should be grateful for that, hear me? She thumped on the table and stared Karna in the face. What's up with this kid? Karna sighed. Why are you acting as you've never slept with your parents? Wait, no. You are just too young to understand. Thomas' face darkened, but Karna didn't notice as he continued. Anyway, did you talk with Big Brother? You really wanted to go somewhere, didn't you? Perhaps to your parents? Oh, Thomas' face darkened further as she said in a barely audible voice, I... I don't have parents. Karna's eyes grew as he instantly bowed. I am sorry. I didn't realize that. He understood why she was reacting that way before. Strangely, when it came to the topic of parents, Karna was pretty sensitive. So he felt bad for hurting Tama even if unintentionally. It's fine. Otama sat back on her chair. You didn't know about it, so I guess it's not your fault. Karna raised his head. Thanks. Tama continued. Anyways, I talked with Mr. Brother Amon. Yes, he did say to call him that. Anyways, he said Brother Ace, the person I wanted to meet, faced an emergency and wanted to take care of it as soon as possible. Brother Amon thought I shouldn't be there, so he took me away and brought me up here in the sky. Oh. Karna exclaimed in surprise, already guessing these were just some made-up stories. He didn't care about hurting her as long as it was not something related to her parents. Tama continued, it seems Brother Amon has already spoken with Brother Ace. So, I guess that's okay. Though I'd like to see Brother Ace once more. She said the last part in a lower tone of voice. Then why not ask him to take you there? Tama nodded at his question. I asked once, he said he was busy, and I can see why. I don't want to be selfish and force Brother Amon to look for Brother Ace. They talked already after all. Though he did promise me that he will take me to see him two years later, he said there will be a big event circling around Brother Ace that time. Okay. Karna nodded, uninterested. He knew she was being manipulated, but he didn't care. Anyway, I recently discovered her power lets her control animals. Perhaps I should take her back as an assistant. She can collect good materials for me. Hee <laughs> hee. Deciding. Be offered. So what do you think about rejoining me? No, you're boring. I'll play with my other friends. She said and proceeded to drink water from a glass cup. Tama got up and wiped her lips. Anyway, I will go now. See you later, boring Karna. Saying this, she ran away. I am boring? Karna only stared at her back with his mouth wide open. Riki transformed into a dragon while Amon rode her to Amazon Lily. Amon took a seat on her head and was directing her using an eternal log pose that he got from the underworld. Brother, isn't there a rumor that the pirate empress is the most beautiful woman in the world? Riki asked as Amon nodded. Her voice was still the same even in her dragon form. She is, and she is strong too. Stronger than me? No. Amon laughed. But she can beat you. You fall into that category, after all. What are you talking about? I am very, very strong now. Before she could finish her line, Amon poked her left eye with a conqueror's hockey-coated finger. Ouch. Riki, the giant Quetzalcoatl, shook aggressively. Bastard. What are you doing? Amon nodded. Two things. One, proving you are weak. Two, I am training. I need to learn how to control conqueror's hockey properly. In the sea, ten marine ships were moving forward together. In a room of the ship in the middle, an old lady was sitting in her chair smoking as someone knocked on the door of the tomb. Knock, knock. May I come in? Ma'am? Hearing the voice, Suru, the old lady, nodded. Please do. Instantly, a female marine officer entered the room and stood in front of Tsuru with her hands locked behind her back. The female had light blue hair and pink rosy lips along with green eyes. Her face was oval-shaped and she was wearing a coat on her back with stars on the shoulders, indicating she was a rear admiral. 
Ma'am, we were able to successfully force the pirate empress to undo her devil fruit effect on our sisters, she said with an expressionless professional face. Suru nodded silently. Hmm, good. That settles it then. Though she was indeed a hard nut to crack. Indeed she was. We only managed to force her by threatening the life of her two sisters. Well, another underhanded tactic. You should stop it, Saya. Even hearing her, the rear admiral, Saya, stayed still. Suru just sighed. Anyways, any news about the reinforcements? Saya checked her hand watch and reported, Yes. I talked with them via Din Din Mushi just nine minutes ago. They have almost reached the Amazon Lily, it seems. Seeing Suru nod, Saya then thought with a grim face, We captured the whole Amazon Lily of 10,000 citizens, but our ships can only hold 5,000. So we are taking 5,000 criminals with us while the remaining 5,000 are still in Amazon Lily, tied up in shackles. Her thoughts ended as Tsuru's old voice reached her ears. We did leave some of our people to watch over them. But if they somehow free themselves, those few won't be able to stop 5,000 of them from escaping, Tsuru said. Nonetheless, since the reinforcements have almost reached the island, nothing bad will happen. You're right, Vice Admiral. She bowed and raised her head. Then I should leave. Crack. Before Saya could finish what she was saying, thunder crackled outside the ship. Thunder. Saya frowned. The sky was clear a minute ago. Suru sighed as she looked at the sky via the window. Ah, Grand Line, and it's bad weather. Brings back old memories, haha. Uh -huh. While Suru was laughing, outside in the dark sky, the figure of a lone man flying closer to the ships could be seen. Chapter 155 Minions Boa Hancock POV Clink Clank KGH These shackles won't come off. I was tied to a small cell within the ship of the Marines. My hands were chained above me, shackled to the wall with sea stone handcuffs. Beside me were Marigold and Sander Sonia. They were shackled similarly as well. Big sister, stop it. Your hands are bleeding. Hearing Marigold's yelp, I looked at my hands. I tortured them to free myself from these shackles. My hands were truly bleeding a lot, yet I didn't care. If only I listened to that old hag and joined the side of an emperor, all my people wouldn't have been captured along with me at least. I released a sigh. We were 10,000, they were 1,000. Yet, they defeated us so easily. We are supposed to be the strongest, the Kuja tribe. But to think we were so weak in the grand scheme of things. Big sis. I gritted my teeth. I have to get out of here. If I de don't, then those noble bastards will recognize me and. No. No. I need to escape. Big sister. Your body. It's trembling. Marigold's concerned voice entered my ears. Uh. I looked at my hands and legs. They were indeed trembling. I see. I'm still traumatized, huh? I was weak. I am weak. I will always be weak. Did nothing change after I was released from that hell? Women are strong. Yes, there are women even stronger than me out there. But they work under those disgusting men. So ultimately, wasn't I just struggling in vain all my life? A teardrop fell onto my thigh. I was crying. My sister saw this and began to cry with me. Big sis, don't give up. We'll do something. We'll make sure you escape at the very least. Their words made me rethink my life up until now. Escape, huh? We three escaped from Marihoy's eleven years ago. Fisher Tiger helped us. I have been indebted to him ever since. But Marines killed him. The one who killed him was a Marine named Borsellino, the current Admiral Cazaro. I didn't know about this before, but just around the time when the news of his return from death spread throughout the world a few months ago, a mysterious source gave me this piece of news. I didn't care what anyone would gain by giving me this news, the only thing I cared about was that along with the nobles, I also needed to kill that man, Borsellino, to appease my benefactor's soul. Yet, before I could even plan my actions, I was beaten by a mere vice-admiral. Anger was rising in my heart. I felt like coughing up blood. But then I realized something. I'm still trembling. My fear for nobles was a lot stronger than my anger. I looked at my sister's faces. Big sister. They were crying. I sighed. I know. We need to escape somehow. I looked back at them. You too. I have a plan. Before I could even tell them the plan, a deafening sound invaded my ears. Crack. The sound only increased my determination to escape. I, Boa Hancock, escaped once. I took a deep breath. Another time won't be hard. Crack. General POV. Minutes ago. Around the island of Amazon Lily, a feathered dragon could be seen flying through the sky, carrying a man on top of its head. The man, while staring downwards, 
was stroking the head of the dragon as if it were a pet. Indeed, it was Amon who was rubbing Riki's head while looking at the island using eagle vision. Oh, so the whole island has been captured. I figured as much. Amon gazed down with his eagle-like eyes and frowned. So they took Boa Hancock and half of the Kujas with them while leaving a bunch of women here to look after the prisoners? I also see a few more marine ships coming here. They must be reinforcements. Amon knocked Riki's head. Hey, can your wisdom I see far? No. I see. Amon took a note of it and nodded. He closed his eyes and canceled eagle vision, only to look at Riki yet again. Anyways, Riki, reinforcements are coming to the island to capture the prisoners. Do me a favor and take them down. Riki nodded her huge head. As you order. Meanwhile, I will go and fetch Boa Hancock, Amon said while stretching his arms. Riki retorted. Hey, I want to meet the Snake Empress too. No, you can't yet. Riki, although she doesn't realize it, has a lot of luck and charisma. She might end up saving Hancock in Amon's place. It would be horrifying. Amon got chills just thinking about it. Sigh, fine. Riki went silent after sighing. I will do as you say, brother. Amon chuckled hearing her soft response. Good girl, now go. I will try to return before you finish. You can't. I destroy them in minutes, hee <laughs> hee. Then it's a challenge, Amon said as he laughed. Z z z. Saying such, Amon vanished from Riki's head, while Riki flew down towards the island. Now that brother's gone, time for destruction. Hee <laughs> hee. Riki stopped midair and looked at the shocked faces of everyone below. Ah, is that a dragon? A massive snake? A monster. While people reacted differently, Riki opened her jaws, a massive orb flew out of it, like how snakes lay eggs. The orb of light prompted everyone to shield their eyes. The orb went out of her mouth and started to float in the sky. Light manipulation. Million beam. Riki screamed. The sky brightened as a second sun appeared in it. Thousands of small, thin beams shot out of it, advancing towards the marines. It was Quetzalcoatl's light manipulation ability. This is where Riki beats Kaido. She doesn't have the power to create the small clouds that Kaido can produce, but she can manipulate light. Z Z Z. Amon was already a thousand kilometers away from Riki. He was floating in the sky while looking down at the ten marine ships. Sheesh, Riki is too strong. I need to awaken my fruit, or I'll fall behind. Amon decided while looking down. Hancock is in the middle one. Amon pointed his finger to try and Elthor it, but ultimately decided against it. Let's see, that old lady's devil fruit is interesting. The only problem is, killing her would be bad for Amon. Not only Sengoku, but even Garp share a pretty close relationship with her. Right now, even though I do have a bad relationship with the Marines, there aren't any personal conflicts coming from those two monsters. Killing her would put me on their kill list. And from my experience, nothing good comes from being at the receiving end of a powerhouse's personal grudge. Amon shook his head. On a later day, lucky old lady. Amon then snapped his finger as the noon sky changed. Dark clouds started to appear from all over the sky and cover the sun, making the sea as dark as black. Rumble. The sea became aggressive as the ships started to shake by the rough waves, some almost getting devoured by the sea. Big waves were created as the screams of tsunamis filled the air. Amon didn't care and contemplated. Anyway, I do not need to engage in a fight with the marines, now do I? The fastest option is to move fast and drop each of them in the sea. Then, take the ships and move it towards Amazon Lily. Stranded in the Grand Line, they won't get the chance to report to their base anytime soon. With a smile, Amon moved while thunder clouds crackled in the sky. Max speed, got speed up. In an instant, Amon entered max lightning speed and went inside the left outermost ship. He dropped on the ship's deck and observed the five people standing there like statues, frozen in time. I love this feeling of being above everyone. In this world, I am God and their lives are at my mercy. Amon laughed a peal of maniacal laughter and walked closer to a female and grabbed her waist. Hmm, I should drop five marines at one spot then change the area of my drops. Z z z. Amon took the female a few kilometers away from there and lightly placed her in the sea. She stood on top of the water, while time was still slowed down. Well then, for more to go. Just like in that movie scene with Quicksilver, Amon grabbed the marine females one by one and dropped them kilometers away from the ship. Finally, coming into the room with Tsuru and another female marine officer, Amon grabbed the other girl and dropped her in the sea far from here just like the others, only to return to this room. Instantly, he whistled looking at Tsuru. Ah, she noticed me when I was flying down here. As expected of her. 
Amon stared at the narrowed eyes of Tsuru that were staring out the window. Lucky old lady, she can't die today, unfortunately. He grabbed her and moved fast again. ZCT. Finally, Amon returned to the ship by directly teleporting to the cell Hancock was in, the Snake Empress, canceling the godspeed. Huh. Moa Hancock blinked as she realized the Marine guards suddenly disappeared from her view. She was planning to free herself by getting a guard close enough to her, for her to ambush the guard. But this sudden change in the events changed how things were supposed to play out. Yo. Suddenly, a man's voice entered her ears as her eyes grew wide. Who? She looked around and surprisingly, found a man in front of her, inside the cell. A frown appeared on her face, she couldn't see his face because of the shadow covering him, as well as the darkness created by the dark clouds blocking the sun, but it was clear, this was a man. Who are you? You disgusting imbecile. Suddenly, the man crouched down and placed his finger on her lips. Shoo, sure, calm down now. I saved you and your people's lives, after all. Treat your benefactor nicely at least. Moa Hancock instinctively tried to bite off his finger, but suddenly, a ray of sunlight came through the window and flashed onto the man's face, making his face clearer. Hancock's eyes grew slightly. It's him. It was the person she had in her mind when thinking about emperors. If I had to join the side of an emperor, it would be him, the person who humiliated the source of my fear and anger. Hancock bit Amon's finger as she stared at his face with wide eyes. Sky Emperor, Amon the Lucifer. That's the end of this tale for now. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you on part 7.